We've got a second. That was just a warning call. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Today is Wednesday, April 22nd, and this is the Town Council Finance Committee meeting. I'll call this meeting to order and note that our, we have a full committee present, Councilors Hamill, Shoup, and myself. Uh, the first item is uh, approval of the minutes from our April 12th, 2023 meeting. So everybody received and had a chance to review the minutes. Uh, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Nope. Okay. All those in favor? Motion passes 3-0, thank you. Uh, next up, we're here to uh, meet with a number of different town departments to better understand the budget proposal uh, that town manager provided almost a, a, a month ago now with the superintendent of schools. Uh, this is the first of what will be several review sessions. There's a lot on the docket for this evening. Uh, it's not my intention to rush through anything. So if we have to bump some of the items, we've prepared for that with, um, with Tom and, and Liam. Uh, <clears throat> we will have time at, at later review schedule, review meetings um, to pick back up. Uh, we are gonna start as, as scheduled with the library. We'll, we'll go through public services, which includes the library, community services and SEGCO. We'll start with the library. You know, they have an important fundraiser to get to at six. So if you are tired of us in an hour, um, I believe it's at none such uh, way. Uh, feel free to support them as well. So we have uh, the library director, Nancy Kral. Um, I saw some other library uh, board members as well. It's, we're gonna have some questions, I think, as we go, but really it's, it's, this is mostly gonna be a staff presentation, um, helping us understand in better detail the, the budgets that have been proposed. Yeah, just, uh, just to set things up, we do have a kind of a common slide deck that everyone is trying to use. So there's, hopefully you'll see a common kind of Theme throughout. Uh, obviously, they're all customized for each of the departments. So, uh, I think Liam's going to run that for everyone. If, without further ado, we can get started. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the most noteworthy part of our budget is the the income. Uh, we have, over the last three years, um, been fortunate enough to take advantage of federal funding through the various uh, programs available, uh, payroll protection program, the employee retention credit, and then a small grant through the state library from ARPA. And uh, we were cautious each year. We presented the budget and said, this isn't going to last and you just need to be prepared. There's going to be a bump when we lose this funding. And in fact, here we are. Um, last year's slide um, at this point mentioned the same topic. So we did make an effort uh, to increase the amount of non-municipal revenue that we've applied to the budget. And we are doing that in a variety of ways. We are uh, tapping our investment portfolio for a small amount of money. And then we are also increasing our fundraising um, initiatives to offset some of what we typically uh, request from the municipality. So um, we've tried to um, dampen the impact of that significant um, amount of federal funds from last year. So I um, also want to mention the uh, CIP, I'll say it right off the top, the CIP request that we have in there for solar panels. We've taken another look at that and have um, withdrawn our request for the solar panels. That was an appropriated amount, so that's the good news. The bad news is less than 10 minutes ago, I got an, in, uh, an estimate from our HVAC company for replacement of our HVAC system to over $26,000. Um, so I didn't even have that information at the point we were putting this together. So I just want to um, note there are some references to it in these slides, but I have the first of many numbers. We have, I don't even know what it says yet. I just went for the number. <laughs> so we'll be working on that. Next. Um, so there are very few um, increases in our, in our uh, lines. One of them I do feel is noteworthy is that we do have translation software available now on our website. And that was uh, funded this year through the Public Library Fund, which is part of the main state taxes. If you go to the back of your tax form, there's a little, we used to call it the chickadee checkoff. Um, we were awarded one of the largest grants this year from the state program. And uh, that went toward our website translation program. We are working more often now with new Americans and having uh, that translation opportunity is a, is, a, is a big deal for us. We're very proud of it. And it seems to be working very well. 
Uh, it also will, um, for people with vision issues, it will also speak the, the narrative that's in the, in the website. So we are going to continue that. And so there will be an increase in our IT budget for that. Uh, we also, I mentioned the fact that we're going to be working harder on our private fundraising. And we want to invest in, in staff to do that. And we're talking about a half, the equivalent of a half-time person. It's a professional level experience that we're hiring. We're not bringing anybody in full-time, uh, but I do have an amount in the budget to cover some additional support for fundraising activity. And then there's the famous, the mechanical services HVAC. We knew it was coming, but we didn't know when. Uh, and we've been working hard to get a number. And um, ironically, it just arrived moments ago. So. Next slide. So it's, there are the realities. <laughs> Fundraising is um, on us now. We, uh, we're actually not concerned about this. We actually learned a lot during the, uh, the um, building program. We learned a lot about how to reach out into the community, the opportunities for, de for increased development. Uh, as a nonprofit, we want to raise more money for what may become a capital campaign in the future, but doing that on an ongoing basis to support annual operations is a good entree into a larger campaign. So there's, there's actually logic to it, but it's hard work. Uh, and it, it isn't um, for folks who are not familiar with a nonprofit development process, it's not fake sales and book sales. It's um, approaching people with capacity, building up relationships, having a, a longer term process and program in place. And we do not have staff to do that at this point. So we really wanna commit to doing that. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, we've got uh, deferred maintenance throughout the building. I just am very focused on the HVAC right now, but there'll be many things that we'll be addressing since we're not going to expand in the near future. We do have to take care of some of the things that we've put off for a while. Next. And um, it, we do wanna acknowledge that there is a line in the CIP budget uh, of 13 million down the road a bit, but we want to be sure that the project for the library is, is not forgotten, it's simply deferred. And so that's a placeholder, it's in a few years down the road, it could be four years down the road. Our intent is in no way to uh, in, interfere with the community center or the unified school project. Our intent is to work closely with those plans, see what we can do to utilize space in the community in whatever way the community's suited for. Uh, so our intent is to be collaborative and not um, in any way hold those processes up. And, uh, and yet we wanna be sure that we're, we're next in line after the next two primary um, priorities. Uh, so that is a placeholder in the budget. Uh, again, the, the date is less certain than the fact that the need remains. The number is simply the number that we have had in the past. We know that in four to five years, there will be a different number. That's the reality. Um, and again, if there's a way for us to do a better job with more certainty of having um, budgets that are clearer, um, language that is clearer, and a fundraising that is clearer, that's all to the good. Uh, as you know, I will not be there as the leader of the campaign at that point, um, but I, um, there is such commitment in this community to make that happen that I'm very confident that when our time comes, um, that the time will be there. <laughs> so those are essentially my slides, so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, any questions from the committee? Go ahead. Uh, no, no questions just yet, but I did want to say uh, kudos to you for anticipating the impact of the loss of ARPA funding. And I know that's a, it's hitting a, a bunch of other units as well. So, you know, uh, hats off to you for, for thinking that through. And I know it's still a gap there, even in spite of that, but it looks like you managed to offset that pretty well. And, uh, you know, we understand the issue of, uh, you know, unplanned bad news, you know, so I guess, how old was the HVAC? Uh, 2006, we're at the 15 year life. Yeah. Got about that right. So, um, so I'll just say, you know, it, it, it's, it's clear that you were, you know, working hard to kind of keep the budget within range. And we understand that you've had, you know, some things that, uh, it, you know, it's probably impossible to try to uh, bring it exactly back to even you know, with, with the things you face, but um, thank you for what you've done to mitigate. Thank you. 
Any questions? Um, I don't have any specific questions. I did note that one of the questions that was inputted into the budget questionnaire thing that was in here was, you know, the library current has a CIP item of 13 million for expansion and they are asking what your current expansion plans were. I feel sufficient with the explanation that we received. I appreciate you guys wanting to work in collaboration with the community center and with the school, um, but otherwise I really don't have any questions. Thank you. And I will, I will provide a written answer to that. Um, I felt I wanted to address it verbally as well. So thank you. Uh, only question that it looks like your revenue is down significantly, about eighty, a little over eighty, eighty thousand dollars, and then your uh, your benefit, your wages and benefits are up about eighty thousand dollars. Is that mostly the half FTE that you talked about? Uh, there's about fifty one thousand dollars in there for the part time person, um, and the rest is the cola Very step process. Modest. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm good. Thank you for coming. What, one other question I'd like to ask you, you indicated that you, you're redoubling your efforts in terms of uh, private fundraising, which is also laudable. So thank you for that. Do you have a sense for how you plan to use those funds, you know, in terms of expenditures versus capital? I think our initial intent is for it to be operations yeah. to support the operating budget. I think um, we have board members now who understand the process and are more committed to seeing that happen and to reduce the burden on the taxpayer. Um, they are completely vested in that um, to their credit. Uh, it's, it's, there is a, a science and a mystery to fundraising. So it's, uh, again, I really wanna reinforce the fact that this is a, this is a commitment. Thanks. Okay. I think no further questions. Uh, you are free to go. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. And I hope it's a very successful fundraiser. So much. Appreciate it. You're going to miss this, aren't you, Nancy? Yes. <laughs> you can come back. <laughs> no, I, you know, you know, I was sitting in the audience more than you like. <laughs> Not more than we like. We, we appreciate it. This is a full Thank crowd, you. Right? Thank you. So predominantly staff. But <laughs> <laughs> Mostly trustees for us, though. Uh, it looks like next up is community services. Todd, are you ready to go? Not ready as Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with Sarah. Like not so. <laughs> so just to sounds like the solar panels for thirty three thousand are coming out. The HVA system twenty six thousand. Yeah. We'll provide additional information as they get better uh, and other cost estimates. Yeah. But I think it's reasonable to say that the same order of magnitude. Um, okay. Floor is yours, Todd. Thank you. So, as in the last couple of budget presentations, I always like to take a little bit of time to kind of educate our our budget. It's kind of complicated what we serve and what we do. So, I'll just highlight on a couple of the things just so people watching or don't understand kind of understand some of our scope of work. So, um, this year our budget proposal is. Uh, uh, $3,615,790. Um, of that, our objective revenue is uh, $2.8 million, and the net impact to the taxpayer is uh, $815,000. Regarding the divisions, just so people understand, uh, our admin uh, division handles all the program registration, um, cable, passports, um, as well as um, all of our marketing outreach and then helps with special events. And then in a generational bucket is um, our child care, before and after care, uh, week uh, vacation camps, senior programming, uh, as well as um, uh, summer camp, our eight week summer camps in that group. Recreation covers all of our youth sports, uh, teen programming, as well as a lot of our summer activities that are just specialty camps, uh, as well as uh, just general youth and adult recreation program lives in that division. Um, parks. Um, is one of our bigger divisions. Uh, it is all the outreach grounds, maintenance for most of our municipal facilities, including this campus as well as the school. We have a partnership with the school and we'll talk about that a little further. Um, maintaining um, the school facilities as well as uh, preparing for athletic events. Uh, the hub is in the first year of a three-year lease. Um, we'll we can talk about that a little more as we go along, but that's where a lot of our new programming is based as well as the staff, our plugger program, and all of our senior programs at the moment. And then the beaches division covers the parking lot, uh, covers trash, uh, covers um, restroom and facilities, 
uh, not only at the beaches, but boat launches uh, are that budget uh, uh, offsets and, and pays for trash and uh, restroom facilities at the co-op as well is in that beach budget. So next slide, please. Uh, this slide is not really a comparison slide of who gets what or how much we make. This is more of a kudos slide from our department is that, you know, when you look at what our total budget is and how much we produce in revenue, uh, you know, including our parks division, we're about 77% self-funded. And we'll talk about the parks division in the next slide, but when you pull that away, we're about 98% self-funded. And so a lot of our decisions are made around whether it's community good or whether it's something that's inclusive or exclusive. So. Uh, staff has done a good job trying to maintain that level of service and kind of keep that that gap through everything else that's going on. Um, next one, please. And this just talks about that net impact to a taxpayer. So taxpayer is really supporting the eight hundred fifteen thousand dollars of our budget. The net impact for parks and ground alone is um, projected this year at that six seventy six sixty seven. So that's eighty four percent of our ask from the town strictly goes for the parks. That other 47 is $1,000 is divvied up amongst the other divisions that support. So most of our operation is self-funded. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, this is just a tool we use, cost recoveries, period. Some people use the slides. This is just when we're trying to make decisions. And I know with our advisory board, we're having a lot of discussion about reviewing costs and fees and what we should do. But this is something that we look at where, you know, mostly community benefit, Summerfest, Santa in the park, you know, those are low cost recovery. We're not expecting to make our money back, which equals high subsidy from the taxpayer or something at the top of the scale, mostly individual benefit like summer camp, like a specific trip where 12 people can go. That's an individual benefit that should be cost recovery because not it's not open and available to everybody. So we kind of look at the scale and we decide what we're charging or what we should be making our money back for. And that includes parks as well. Um, next slide, please. You're probably going to hear this through all the presentations, and I didn't highlight them in general, but utilities, cost of supplies and materials, contracted services that we use, their prices are going up, as well as um, deferred maintenance. We're seeing a lot of that. It's depicted in the master plan. Um, things that we put off during COVID that we didn't do, those things are now starting to compound. So we're going to strategically start to catch up on some of those things. So that's one reality in the budget. Next slide, please. Here's our big budget drivers um, and open to conversation on anything, but our operational costs are outpacing our revenue projections for this year. They're just, we, we're not growing as fast. We are looking at um, wage increases. One of the goals of the um, Community Service Advisory Board, they're gonna be taking on looking at beach fees and kind of atmosphere this summer. You know, fees and policies or price and policy dictates how something runs and who comes and how you manage it. So they're taking that on. And our staff is now looking at um, fees. I don't like to raise revenue projections unless I get two solid years of good numbers because we just don't know, you know, weather, participation, people dropping in and out. It's not like I've got 3,000 people with a water main and I'm going to get that every single time. You'd never know if that participant rate is going to change. So we're working how to change that, close that gap. Um, um, but again, it comes down to that previous slide about choice. Uh, big budget drivers here, you know, we have 16 full-time staff and probably 100 part-time staff that work seasonally. So that's a substantial amount of that increase. Um, we do have in the budget this year, uh, we've been talking about it with the school uh, for a few years now, and we've agreed to move it forward this year for discussion is we're looking for two more full-time parks maintenance workers. There's the total cost, 136. The school has it on their side as a revenue expense. And, and I know we've gone through that discussion of in, out, back in. Um, but this, you know, we have a good relationship with the school right now. We've worked really hard over the past year to kind of get to a point now where what's the level of service we can provide. Um, one thing I'm sure everybody can agree on, there's more people outside, there's more people visiting, habits they've picked up during COVID. Um, that being put aside, we are struggling to maintain what we have now. And um, we pride ourselves on, you know, we prioritize. Yesterday, we pulled two guys off another job at a park to come get infields ready for a baseball game because the field needed more time. Um, our goal with this is to provide the same level of service for the school, hopefully increase in certain areas that we've identified, as well as raise the level to everybody else in town. All the youth groups, all our partnerships, all the things that we do, beach, 
um, we have a very good, very skilled crew right now. This is also a retention thing for us. They just can't work at the pace that they are. And we've said, be patient, be patient, be patient. So now we've decided this is the time to come forward. Um, so that would be an offset by a revenue. There's two other items on here for discussion. Um, in the property maintenance in the parks line, you'll see a $45,000 increase. It went from 30 to 75. Um, two specific targets there. Uh, one is $15,000 out of that money. Um, we've identified it for years and is re-identified in the master plan when you go through the checklist. We've got hundreds and hundreds of miles of fence line. Split rail, chain link fence that is just rotting, uh, rusting, cooling over. So be a slight exaggeration. Hundreds of miles. Well, I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe a hundred miles. I'll go out. We have, I've never seen so many split rail in my entire life, but you know, I just priced it out to have a company come in. It's $330 a section for a company to come in to do it. So the other part of having some full-time maintenance workers is to be able to have some time to be able to do some of this maintenance ourselves uh, and just buy material because we have a skilled crew right now. The other part of that uh, $30,000 out of that, at least that one task is uh, dedicated to put into our master plan regarding our parking lots. Um, I couldn't find where the last time we've crack sealed and seal coated and restriped. And some of that work we might be able to get done through public works, but most of that is outside contracting. Um, and it's really a cheap investment compared to doing an overlay for a full parking lot. If you go to our parking lots, there's organic matter through all of them. And so this is more of an investment in maintenance. So um, talking with Todd Jepson from the school, that 30 is kind of a number he carries and what it usually gets him is a parking lot and a crack fill. And so he rotates through all those lots every year. So that's kind of the model after discussing that with him that I'd like to start in our operating budget, being able to rotate through our all of our parks and facilities to get our parking lots up to speed. Uh, and then lastly, it's something that Tom and I have talked about for a long time, three years, if that's a long time. Uh, and Karen brought up during our, our budget process when I was going over it with our advisory board is looking at proposing a seasonal park ranger. Uh, this funding right there identifies a little bit of uh, material and outfit for the person, uh, but really the majority of that cost is 24 weeks, 40 hours a week uh, to start the program. Uh, this is more in response to uh, two things. One, we've identified with the police department, it's harder and harder to get reserve officers. It's harder to get them timely. Um, and um, this, a park ranger is, his or her role is more about education to create prevention where people understand the rules. Uh, this is knock on the, not a knock on the police department, but it's a different mentality, right? I'm not here to enforce, I'm here to educate, I'm here to explain. And they can have the time to build the relationship and then follow back up. Uh, park rangers duties are also revolved around um, maintenance and quick repairs. So when they see something, they're trained to be able to handle it versus put it off or come back and get it. Um, you know, and that is, is in the beaches and the parks. Um, and so that's really the, the couple of big budget drivers. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the common slides this year is alignment with council goals. In this budget, we've kind of focused on the strategic planning and facilities planning, and I won't read the rest of it there, but, um, and I did watch the um, um, budget um, council corner yesterday and, you know, our purchase of the municipal Purchase land for municipal purposes is one of the statements in the thing. And um, through our advisory board, this is a direct recommendation from the advisory board was to put an amount of money in the budget to start the conversation and aid in the community center process. That number is just a number. I went online, looked at what four or five acres is going for in Scarborough here or there. There's no land identified. There's no conversations about where or what. This is more about a tool that we probably, I hope we can all agree on is that when a piece of property comes available in Scarborough, it goes very fast. And so when we start the, well, when we continue the commitment that you guys have laid, we have forming the ad hoc committee, we're working on gathering the feasibility study to start moving that forward. The biggest thing in getting the end product and what everybody wants to know, how big, where, and how much it's gonna cost, unless you have a site and we've learned that from the school and that's been a lot of the criticism of the school and I'm on that build committee is we haven't been able to give a final number. So this is just a number pulled out of the hat. It could be a million, it could be a hundred thousand dollars. It can be $1. It's more about identifying that we as a town, if we really want a community center and we won't know till we get to the end of the process, 
that we are prepared if a piece of property comes available. That's it. Is that's all this is about is to be prepared when the opportunity comes, if something matches and being able to support the ad hoc committee through their work. Because that's the first thing the consultant is going to ask, where is this going? And I'm going to say, we're going to, we're going to work on that. Right. And so that's the key. And those, if you follow the school build, those are all the conversations, right? How big, how tall, where, how long, how long is the road, where's the utilities, the infrastructure? What does it feel like? You can't answer that until you put it on a site. And so that's why this is there. This is really the, the, a key pillar in the process. Again, ultimately, it's got to go to the voters. Ultimately, it's your decision whether it gets to the voters. But the land, is a, it's a big deal. It's a big deal in the process. So that's why that's there. Um, in the budget, you will also see in the parks in, um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, um, contracted service, you'll see an increased line there of $75,000. That was one of the counselor questions. Um, uh, after speaking to uh, a couple different firms that we work with through the master planning, uh, and then again, trying to meet this goal, we've, we proposed $75,000 in the budget to be offset with the rec impact fees fund um, to be able to allow us to, once the advisory board looks at the implementation, what are those goals? I can start matching and that's what I'm working on right now. We just, they're picking items out of the master plan. They've given it to me. I got to come back with, we can move this. This is a challenge. This is something we need to budget for, but ultimately to bring back a project, it's going to need to be vetted, right? Site, development, environmental, all those pieces, engineering, um, and the one thing I've learned in, since I've been here is that uh, we have great staff. When I call Angela and she can help, she does. When I call Public Works and I need help, they do when they can. But we're all busy. So we need to be able to have funding available when keep things on track to meet budget cycles and to have proper planning because there's nothing worse than when you've done all that work and you don't have the final due diligence or it's a timing thing. So this is, this is to be able to help master planning process continue and design plans that we can actually implement, but have true costs by somebody that's looking at escalators. Oh, this is gonna be out three years from now. We'll add so much percent, and this is what the market's looking like. And so this keeps those numbers more current, better than I ever could. And so that's why we're asking for this funding here to kind of work along that goal. Um, so new initiatives in the budget, and some of these aren't new, but they're, they're kind of high level importance. Two full-time parks maintenance workers, uh, parks facilities master plan implementation. Um, you know, I've said this, Karen and I have numerous conversations. I've said this to a lot of people. We haven't been sitting on our hands waiting for the master plan to be approved or accepted. We've been doing things along the way. And so, um, you know, we're hoping that we can start reporting out what we've started to tackle programming, uh, some of the, the, the maintenance and repairs and some of the planning thoughts. A lot of the things in the budget, wages, adding of staff, um, Staff development. Um, our staff has flexed as, as much as most during the last couple of years. Um, but now it's time to reinvest back in them, find more training opportunities. Um, and, you know, with childcare right now, the things that students are going through right now are things that a lot of my staff aren't trained on. And so how do we get them up to speed? We don't have counselors or health workers or social workers at aftercare. So we have to invest in our staff to keep them and retain them because it's more stressful for them. And so we're, we're working with our management and our lead staff to how do we take care of our part-time staff? That's what makes us go. Um, and then in the budget, so it's, it's kind of confusing. You'll see there's a line in the youth programming about program development seed money. There's $10,000. When you look at the uh, revenue side of the house, there's $10,000. What I've done in my previous jobs and I'm just finally starting to implement it here is we're building new programs all the time. And so when my staff builds a program we haven't done, they're going to pay for the expense out of this. The revenue will go into it because it's we can be as creative as we can to make more programming, but we got to pay for it somewhere. And so the practice here is build a program, and I'm making this up, pottery, pay for it out of this account. Revenue goes in that account. Next year, those go into the operating budget. And then you keep building program in that way. It's a way to not over budget. And you have a small start of money. So that's a new initiative. We're going to kind of task with staff to be creative and not worry about um, where that first set of money is going to come, right? It's like a business development. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, key capital investments. Um, 
this is just more kind of how my thought process is. And I started to explain this to the advisory board last week at our last meeting. Um, most of this budget this year is focusing on parks and facilities. We're just, that's our biggest, you know, we've seen it through the, the, um, the report. Um, and so I'm breaking things out into three buckets right now with my park staff. We're looking at our parks and facilities as existing facilities that need repair or their safety items, existing facilities that we can renovate or make improvements. And, and that is to reach either a service that we're not doing or a service that's underutilized and then new facilities and new services. If you go through the CIP, and I know that's another night, but out of the 10 things we're talking about this year, I think seven of them are in the repair and safety. Things we already own, things we've already built, things we got to take care of. Um, I think there's a couple in there about improvements, water fountains, you know, stuff like that, amenities, and then a new facility, something would fall in that new facility. If we do move forward with um, some sort of land or a strategy for the process, that would be something that falls under that new facility of service. So when I start building our planning, we're going to start looking at these categories because there's, you know, to me, the first one is the most important. We have things we have to take care of. And that's what a lot of the CIP budget this year is um, renovation, repair or safety items that we need to address. And then ultimately, because it's a goal, ultimately, because we brought it up in community service, you know, surveys, master plans is to continue this community center development process so we can work through the end of it and, and have an answer if it's something we want to bring forward or or not. That's the choice that'll be done at the end. Um, yeah, so that's the speed version of. I'm not trying to rush you through it. Nope. A lot to unpack there. Uh, any questions from counselors? Anybody want to start? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, uh, I'm pleased to hear you say that you, you know, recognize that we have aging facilities and parks and that needs attention. And if we don't keep up with it, then we're going to fall behind the curve and it's going to be bigger expense. So kudos to you for that. But I will say when I listen to you and hear you talk about the range of programs, I, I sense a lack of, you know, critical few priorities. And you offer things, you know, that range from passport applications to daycare, you know, bridge, bridge games, that sort of thing. And the feeling that I have is that you have a lot of these initiatives that not all of them are really, really connecting. And, and, and yet at the same time, you're planning to take on things that were done uh, through purchase services in the past, like I, like bringing on, you know, taking responsibility for your grounds, you know, and doing that yourself with your own staff. I just, I don't understand that. So I'd like to see a narrower focus and, and better, collaboration of you with with other efforts that are underway you, you mentioned this thing about the five hundred thousand dollars for the land for you know potentially for a community center well we you know we just had a presentation about that and a presentation about open space efforts and so forth so i don't you know those things, sorts of things i you know some of them i'd rather have you be a participant than trying to be leading all of those things and adding new things and i think if, if you look at just implementing your strategic plan alone, that is giant. So I, I just like to see, you know, more focus on a, a critical few priorities. And um, the other thing I would say is I know repeatedly, I've heard you use this discussion, um, this sort of abstraction, I'll say, uh, as uh, we're kind of self-funded. Well, how much of your income really comes from fees, you know, things like parking, and how much is actually comes from taxpayer funds, you know? So, you know, that's the question I have. Yeah. Well, I mean, that first slide. So right now we're generating, you know, $2.8 million in revenue. So that's coming from the taxpayers are paying $815,000 of that ask. Okay. If we were to fully, so that was that slide. So, so we're asking for the three, we're raising 2.8. So 77% of what we're asking for, including the grounds, including the work for the school is, is funded through programs. So I, I just, let's just take parking, for example, sure. this is close you know, near and dear to my yep. heart because we've been, you know, yeah. someone, uh, you know, a business owner uh, brought up the possibility of of trying to do a pilot on passport. I know, and yeah. I, I know you participate yeah, in those meetings as well. So, so how much, you know, how much revenue do we generate from parking at Herd Park, for example? Yeah. Yeah. On an average beach season, it's anywhere from 470 to 510. So big a, number. A, a percentage of that is season passes. And then Heard Park, Ferry, and Higgins Beach, in that order, is the day pass revenue generation. So I, I look for you to help 
help others that are you know trying to you know revisit that. I know there's a, a group of coastal waters folks of this and with yeah. Tom's help have decided not to make a commitment to try to do uh, any kind of test with paid parking down at the point. Yeah. Um, that said, though, I think there's an opportunity there, and I think that's an area where you could add a lot of insight. But that those would be my, you know, my key points to you. I would say that your, I think your number is a little high still, and then the new ads to staff, particularly the idea of a park ranger, I think we're going to have to really take a hard look at stuff like that. Yeah. Understand. Thank you, Councilor Shu. Some general questions. Uh, when I just Googled how many square miles Scarborough is, it came up with 70. Is that correct? Or is Google not? Yes, um, it's high. And so I thought it was 50 or 56. Yeah, I yeah. it's the water. <laughs> Are you in charge of the water? Um, you said that you have 16 full time staff. Is that normal for a town this size with a population over 20,000? It's hard to answer that because we do a lot of things that a lot of divisions don't do, but no, it's not, especially in our parks division. When you look at other municipalities, our size, the amount of staff, especially picking on the school road, most places have parks crews and staff crews, school crews. And so um, that's why the focus has been, how do we, how do we upkeep and, 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 and get caught up? And so um, the answer is no. Yeah. And not to go sideways, but the advisory board does talk a lot about, you know, the, the balance that you have between maintaining the town's properties and the school's properties. And it sounds yep. like certain times you have to prioritize right. no matter what. Um, I think I just, my comments were, and I think Todd will say that, I mean, since I was part of the advisory board years ago, Park Ranger has been a big part of the conversation. And I think town council recently got a bunch of emails about trash cans. And I think these are the type of things that we're trying to address problems with a park ranger. I'm seeing the pictures down at Higgins Beach is disgusting, to be honest. And I think a, introducing a park ranger would be like the perfect solution to maybe sort of deal with those situations. So I'm going to continue to back that up. I'm going to continue to say, let's take the trash cans away and educate people on where they're supposed to bring and put their trash. So I support these initiatives like that. Um, and then also, I think I just kind of have some comments. You know, we have, you know, Todd said he has $500,000 in there for the community center land purchase, I mean, I think what we've discovered is there's not a lot of land. And I think that we need to be prepared to act. And I also think this is a direct response. And I've continued to say this to the survey that town council did. I mean, we're funding another survey next year. What's the point of funding a survey and doing them if we're just going to look at the responses and then not do anything about it? So I'm going to continue to say that this is a direct response that, you know, Todd is looking at what the community wants and he's responding. Um, I think this is really important to also show the residents that we hear you. We understand we have priorities, but we also have needs and wants. So I, I'm going to continue to advocate for that $500,000 to be sitting there and ready to move on because I don't know when and where we're going to find land. And I think we have an obligation to respond to our taxpayers and the residents who said that this is something that they really wanted. And if you caught my council corner article, this is what every other town our, our size has. And, you know, a lot of money and is going out of town. And it would be great to put that money back into this department. Um, Just so I could on the, on the uh, community center land, it is uh, certainly possible, if not likely, that we could locate that on this campus. And therefore, land purchase would not be required. But, um, you know, past councils and finance committees have been very clear about really using the capital five-year capital uh, outlook, if you will, as kind of building up to and, and giving line of sight into these projects. And I think Todd was very apt in bringing up the example of the, the, the school site selection process, which has really hampered their ability to take the next critical steps in terms of defining um, how much it's going to cost, essentially. And so this is a, a direct result to respond to those sorts of realities. And I guess the final piece is, uh, the survey has been clear, not just most recently, but for decades uh, around the concept of the community center. Now, details matter, costs matter for sure. Um, and past councils have funded uh, design professionals to assist in advancing that concept. And, and again, uh, we can't advance much of that thinking and planning until we have a site plan. I, I just want to build, build on that point, Tom, that you made, which I think is a good one. But if I look at our recent experience, and if we ever hope to kind of learn from that, I think one of the big 
issues we had with the library uh, attempt to get funding was that we had really tried to get uh, the library together with community services to make sure that we weren't duplicating adverse space, that sort of thing. I, I think we still have a gap in, in terms of being able to do that. Uh, I think it's even larger than it was before, given the sort of things we're considering with school, land for school, land for community center. We really need to think very broadly and, and in a more integrated fashion so that we're not duplicating efforts, resources, communities, and so forth. So I, you know, I, and you know, I hear what Karen's saying, and I, I support the community services effort, uh, you know, notwithstanding whatever happens, you know, or not with the with the school. But I, I, uh, if I were a park ranger with a resume, I'm not sure I'd want to be on green garbage cans. I'd rather get somebody who, you know. <laughs> But they're not going to be emptying garbage cans. They're going to be educating people on how to dispose of trash because that's literally a problem that we apparently have. And the only comment that I'll make in response to Tom is I've continued to say this for safety reasons. I will not support putting a community center in the municipal. I just do not think it's safe. I do not think there would be a parking. I don't know if you guys come through here when school's coming in and out. Oh, you, being, in this being in that. So that's why I will continue to say we do need money for land because I just don't think we have the capacity in the campus to do it. Um, Fair point. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I had a couple of items. I I liked your capital plan. Um, it, whether funding for the community center or land, that's a question mark for me, whether that needs to be in this budget or not. I would like to understand if there's other funding sources that could be used for that as well. I, I know that there were some exceptions for the uh, parks and recreation land bond that may have messed up the name there, but I thought recreational facilities one of, was one of the allowed uses, but I don't recall specifically. Right, I mean, we can, when we get into the, you know, that'll be something I'm sure comes up with the consultants and with the ad hoc committee is all the sources and, and we can land and water conservation fund, block grants, different resources or other partnerships. And that's the thing that's different with a community center versus a school and maybe like a public safety building is that there are other entities that may pay rent or different models. There's different models to look at how you subsidize your operation. So I think that's going to be some of the work that we didn't do in the first round of the ad hoc because it's a, this, what's different with this process is we're not vetting another opportunity like it was before at the downs. This is vetting what the community wants. And is it something then the community is willing to pay for at the end? And so I think all those things will need to be looked at. The, uh, and again, this is a question I don't know the answer to, but it sounds like it, it might be plausible. Um, I'd like that, I like the park ranger idea, just eyes on um, some of the, the different sites, just somebody there um, can make a difference sometimes. I don't think his full-time job is gonna be emptying trash, but um, if there's a yeah. mess, he'll see it uh, before maybe hopefully a resident. Um, property maintenance, you're, you're, it clearly looks like it's a focus of, of your budget, taking care of what we have. Can we use downtown TIF revenues for, for some of these things? I, I don't know. Um, yeah. It sounds like it, you know, some of the burdens that we're, we're facing is due to growth. Um, so maybe there's a connection there, but, um, or it's worth researching. Um, the 75,000 for design and development, I, had, I didn't know what that was for, but yep. your explanation was very helpful. So it's, it's really trying to put together shovel ready projects based on the, the facilities master plan. Yes. Okay. And then when you do something like that, then maybe it does become eligible for TIF revenues or other funding sources. Yeah, the other thing that money will help us do is to have more refined budget figures rather than, you know, you've heard the word placeholder a couple times already tonight. Right. You know, that is, a, you know, a, a best guess, if you will. But uh, we're hoping to refine that. So when we do put a number in the capital program, uh, it's much more realistic and closer to what it actually is. Um, all that having been said, it's a big increase that you're looking at this year. And I, I, I go back, I, beach parking, right? We're, uh, you got an eight week window, maybe a little bit on the edge of that. Uh, our pricing today is just flat. I, I mean, I understand for residents, we certainly want passes and ability to, to make it accessible and affordable, but um, is there opportunity there uh, in the short term to, to do something more market-based? I mean, in Old Orchard, it's 40, 50 bucks to park now. Oh, yeah. I mean. This goes back to a conversation two years ago that we brought forward that was, I won't, that was brought forward to raise the fee to meet some of these growth things. And I think that's part of, again, price and policy dictate whether they're coming to us because we're paying 15 versus paying 30 at OOB or 40. And so um, it, it, I will say this is something that 
the advisory board has brought up, but I have asked them, it's not something we can do right now because of marketing signs. We start selling season passes on Monday. And that's why last time I brought this forward, uh, we did it in the fall because then we have the data from the summer and then we can say and go through all the process. It's, it's signage, it's, it's education. It's, it's all the piece to put out there. Uh, Cause the last time we raised the fee and I learned from this, we went from 10 to 15 and it, we did it within a month. My poor staff was just annihilated with people that were just miserable. Yeah, I, I just want to share a personal experience, recent personal experience with raising fees. You know, we took some serious lumps on that, yep. with mooring and pure use yep. fees. So, and it was probably deserved. But part of the reason why was because it took so long. Yep. It had been so long since we had raised fees. Yep. So, and I remember a couple of years ago when we just decided not to do that. And there were good reasons at that time. Yep. We were getting a lot of pressure yep. from folks that were coming here and they had the benefit of going early and that sort of thing. But I, I'd say, let's not wait. Let's not wait another couple of years before we try to get back. Yeah, no, it's on the advisory board. It's one of their main goals. I've shared all the data with the board on what we did previously, all the towns we looked at, what and why. And again, it's going to, the challenge last time was there was a lot of philosophical questions that were asked. Who are we serving? Is it the resident or is it the surfer? Is it the surfer or is it the family coming down? There is the dog walker and the thing went sideways and a fast. And so part of the conversation is your policies and your price dictate how things operate. And so that's what the advisory board, we just had it last, last week when we talked about it is what's the atmosphere they want down there. And so they're going to look at policies and procedures and be able to come back. And hopefully we'll all be able to bring something back in the fall to say, council, here's where we need to go. Here's the projected um, fee structure. But I agree. It should have gone up two years ago. Yeah. I, uh, so I, Residents passes keep. I, I have no interest in increasing those, those yeah, prices. Right. I just I can't go. You got eight weekends. You know, you could do, easily double what you're charging. And how much revenue? That would probably pay for your park ranger plus. Um, yeah, easily. So I I, I don't want to just. I, I'm not completely dropping it. We can change the fees um, in the structure, and it may be a way to pay for some of the things that are I think in Todd's budget that are very important. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I had a question on the the frequently asked question sheet and I haven't looked at as yep. responded to but the actual revenues for beach parking were reported they, they were the same thing as the budget for 2021 and 20, 2022 can you just get us what the actual numbers are so, I, I'm sorry I don't know what you're asking so in the uh, in the budget book Yep. You, uh, there's a section that has the, the budget ask, but it also shows what the actual numbers were for the past couple of years. Okay. And right now, the actual numbers are, are equal to the budget for those years, which just doesn't seem accurate. Uh, and I, I'd have to get a definition from Ruth, but that's an accounting piece. So the way that that budget works, and mm -hmm. tell me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. is that we do an estimated revenue, and then we have the expense. And if we don't overspend and we make our revenue, Anything on the backside then goes into the beach reserve. So if I say I'm going to make 470, if we don't overspend the budget and they don't need to offset the revenue, if we make 530 goes to the reserve account and there's a policy on how we can use that for maintenance and what that can go to. So that's why in the book, and that's a munis, that's an accounting piece from finance of why that. Yeah, I think Todd's uh, described it. And, and uh, monies from that reserve have gone to offset capital expense um, Certainly at Higgins and I think all right. beaches actually over the years. So and that was what I'm looking for is what what did you, you actually actual... collect? Yeah, for... no, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can okay. definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Beach, for beach yeah. Yeah. can do that um, for a couple of years. It, you know, yeah, I can get you. I can get your five year window. And that'll help when we talk. It will give me better context when we talk about what the impact of changing fees or whatnot might be. Sure. There. Yep, we can do that. Um, any other questions for Don? Thomas? No. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Next up is thank you. I just want to forewarn everybody. I, I believe we may lose a few people at six. We may recess at six for just period uh, okay. until we can get another meeting going and then we'll reconvene. Um, so no pressure. Not fast. Is that no, what you're saying? We don't have to talk. <laughs> we, we will come back. We may just have to. Take a break in the middle. 
Sure. Uh, thank you for um, inviting me here to talk about what we're doing at SEDCO and how uh, the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation uh, work plan fits in with the towns and how we work together. So let's start quickly with um, an overview of the budget. Um, so we're going to be up about $16,000. That's a 6% increase overall. And really, that's all about staffing and um, benefits. And so staffing and benefits comprise 85% of our budget. Uh, we're a staff of two. So we can move on. So in terms of budget drivers, just like I said, um, full-time staff pay is the uh, biggest uh, increase here. That's the, uh, and it's up 7%. Personnel benefits is really following that. Um, the only unusual piece that we have in there, if you're looking, it looks like, you know, we're spending amazing amounts of money on dental insurance. What that is, is we had one staff person opt into dental. So our, our costs doubled from 500 to 1,000 or something like that. So it does look big. Um, oh, okay, we're rushing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. We're not rushing. That's all right, that's right. Plenty of time. <laughs> you know, our general operating budget, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's labeled as contractor services um, in your budget, but that's really our operating budget. Yeah, we're down $30. Um, <laughs> it's just, we, we budget pretty tightly. And um, in the end, when we added everything up, we were off 30 bucks. Or we were uh, down 30 bucks and we just left it that way. So we've reduced our operating budget by 0.1%. Uh, marketing communication, we didn't um, show an increase in there. That is the fund that we use to do um, a, a number of things. One of which is we, um, the, the constant contact account that the town uses is part of our marketing budget. So we pay for that. Um, we obviously uh, you know, also use it, but it's a very flexible piece. And we used to have two different accounts and that didn't make sense. So now we're all one big happy family uh, with constant contact. Um, it also includes um, some of our online work that we do. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, and we do do some advertising, mostly it's image advertising, and um, those are things like uh, we do, and we have done an annual uh, profile of the town in Main Biz. Um, that's been very helpful, I think, just to um, help people understand what's important to the town. Um, and now you can move on if you want. <laughs> In terms of economic realities, we are so fortunate that uh, the building that we're in, uh, our landlord is very good to us. So our landlord uh, has in our one rent, which is 740 a month now, that is utilities, cleaning, building services. So we're all in at 740. Um, and so we did an increase last year. And so there's no increase this year. We're, we're flatlined for that. Um, again, no increase in the rent. Um, all of our capital expenses are part of our operating budget. So when we need to buy a new computer, which we will um, either late this year or early next year, um, you know, we, we take it right out of our, our operating budget. Um, we do have something that's not, that's not technically in the budget, but we do fundraising. And we do that as an offset to our annual meeting each year. And so that's done through sponsorships. Uh, we do charge a small amount um, for folks who are attending. We do have it at the Black Point Inn and we try to keep the uh, tickets to 25 bucks so people can come and enjoy a good evening, chat with you guys who attend. And uh, we really feel like that's an important event for really building community. And again, we raise those funds. If we have anything left, um, that really goes to support maybe other events. Like this year, we do have um, probably about $500 left. Um, we'll use some of that to support um, another event that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but again, that directly offsets. What we do is we say, all right, here are all of it, our expenses. Um, this is what, going to cost us and then we take that $10,000 off the top before we show you your the budget. So alignment with council goals. Um, I think we're a fairly versatile 
little department that tries to help out in a lot of different ways. So let's talk about the residential growth management in terms of council goals. Um, we just finished the, the growth report that I think you saw um, a couple of weeks ago. We have been working with the small committee that's working on the uh, rate of growth ordinance. And we obviously have helped out with the comprehensive plan and certainly dealing with some of the certification process there. In terms of housing choice and homelessness, that's something that's uh, really been on our uh, radar. I actually sit on the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Committee um, as requested by uh, Lauren Dempsey Martin, who runs that, that, that program. Um, and as part of that, we really did talk about homelessness a great deal over that past time. And so having familiarity with the Community Development Block Grant planning grant, I really felt like it was a perfect opportunity um, to go and say, you know what, we could use some funds um, to really help us do some planning work. So Lauren and I worked on that grant together. We feel like um, it's going to give us some really great base data and it will lead to funding opportunities the following year because that is your first step in the community development block grant funding, do the planning grant, then you can go on to some of the larger programs that are really beginning to pay um, and work with communities to offset some of those costs. Um, the, that's okay, trying to run us up. In terms of strategic capital and facilities planning, uh, part of what we're doing is um, certainly working with the town manager um, and some other staff on looking at impact fees and how we're justifying them and, and how we make those improvements. Um, and there were a couple of other things on that, but we'll move on. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, we we are the we are the basis. Okay, well, TIF applications those start with us if somebody is doing a credit enhancement agreement, and so we have been working with a, a few companies um, over the past year. Those haven't come to fruition for a lot of reasons. Um, so uh, again, that's something that starts in our department. In terms of sustainability, conservation, and climate change, um, one of the things that you may not know is we do have uh, visitscarbromaine.com. That's a website that we run, and we have uh, a lot of the opportunities that are here in Scarborough. We think of it as a resource for our residents. Um, it certainly is a place to, if you're a visitor, to understand what's going on. Um, we have also, we started this in 2019. Um, we have gathered all the natural resource, um, uh, uh, our, our organizations and brought them together so that we can understand what people need, um, who's doing what, when are people doing fundraising and really help uh, uh, understand better how we can all be supportive together. Um, and Todd was very helpful. Um, we just had a, just re-engaged and had another um, uh, group meeting on March 24th, where we went through the um, uh, new recreation and open space plan. Um, but it was just such a, that's one of the, the most interesting and um, I think joyful uh, groups that I've ever worked with. And uh, some really good things will be coming out of that. And that really is part of the reason we're involved is that we had a, a interest in ecotourism and how that works in Scarborough and how that affects um, the economy. And so that's how we started working with this group. Um, in terms of public engagement, um, we have what we call Business Update Scarborough. It's a Facebook page. That is our... our um, public facing Facebook page where we're really, we call it our uh, business to consumer um, Facebook page, as opposed to most of our work, which is really big B2B business to business. Um, that's really where we just try to keep track of what's happening in businesses, um, let people know changes in hours, you know, new businesses opening. Um, so that's available and it's been uh, fairly popular. We do uh, newsletters on demand when something comes out. Um, we certainly do forums. Um, our annual meeting, I think, is uh, essential for building that relationship between the community and or between the, the town and businesses. Um, we also sit on the boards of directors of the Chamber of Commerce and by local um, 
I was just at Visit Portland uh, speaking last week, which is the um, regional tourism program. Um, we belong to Merida and, and participate in that. So those are the types of things that are really um, trying to align with the council goals. In terms of new programs, um, we're a little bit stretched. So we try not to, you know, overshoot, you know, what we're, we're trying to do. But this year, our board really is interested in doing an ambassador program for new businesses. We feel like the level of complexity in terms of development is um, sometimes a, um, complicated for folks. And we want to be there to hold their hand. And um, some of our board members are business owners who've gone through the process and they want to um, reach out and be ambassadors. And so we're working on that. So I promise we take a break. Okay. Uh, six, roughly, just the, I know the time and need to get another meeting kicked off and then we can be here. Okay. I suspect it'll be between five and 10 minutes. Why don't we, why don't we plan to reconvene and we'll some stuff? And okay. then we'll keep the record. Okay. We're, 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 we're almost done. We could call it done if you wanted. Thank you. We're not going to call it done. <laughs> okay. We haven't asked you any questions yet. There we go. <laughs> Call it done on my presentation.
Mary. Welcome back. Um, we are going to continue our meeting now with uh, Senko. I know there's at least a slide that you didn't get to. So sorry for the pause in action and we're gonna reconvene and go ahead. It's all good. We're, we're down to the pretty pictures now. So this is the website that we were talking about, the Scarborough, visit scarboroughmaine.com. And again, we have, you know, your basics uh, connected to all of the different um, uh, natural resource organizations connected to restaurants, um, you know, where to shop, where to stay. So those basics of a visitor website um, are there, but I think it's also um, very rich in its resources and is helpful if you're, you know, it's a summer day and you're trying to figure out what to do with uh, all your visiting relatives um, that have come to town. So we just want to make sure that people know that that's there. We do all the work ourselves. So we put the website together and we um, um, do the fulfillment of all the data in it. So if something's wrong, just let me know. <laughs> Next. And then I wanted to leave you, leave you guys with the types of things that, that I talk about when I'm out and working with um, the image of Scarborough and talking with different um, committees and uh, organizations. I was at Visit Portland last week at their annual meeting speaking. And this is what I reminded them. This is the true Scarborough. This is what we're all working toward. This, this is the image. It's in our logo. Um, this is a photo from this year. Um, and if you'll go ahead and go to the next one. Okay. When I was at Visit Scarborough, we were talking about, uh, I'm sorry, Visit uh, Portland. What I, what I wanted to talk about is this intersection that we have between visitors, residents, businesses, and the town. And that's really part of what I do every day is try to find those intersections and convene people to talk about how we all work together. And I just thought this was a very beautiful photo that we um, have done, obviously looking um, back towards Scarborough Beach. But this is what we're all thinking about when we think about Scarborough. Um, and so with that, leave you with a pretty picture before you have a question. Very pretty picture. And I couldn't, I, I'm glad you said Scarborough Beach because that, yeah. I thought it was there, but it wasn't. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm not used to seeing it from that perspective. I know, I know. So. Very cool. Uh, okay, thank you for that, Karen. Any questions? i just like to say, uh, um, just to congratulate uh, Karen on the work that uh, she and her small band of two or three people are able to get done, so two people. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's, it is an amazing volume of work, number one, and uh, the complexity is significant. I mean, we, talk, we were talking during the break about the work that Karen is leading, you know, with or has recently completed with the implementation of the, uh, the comprehensive plan. And it was an incredible amount of detail work in addition to the work that went into it, a complete rewrite of the thing. So, you know, we most people don't know how much time and effort it takes and it was a good quality product. So thank you for that. Um, one quick thing I was just going to mention, and I'm, I'm not picking on you and your staff of two people, but, uh, you know, as we look at overall numbers, I'd like people to kind of remember, you know, we're looking at, in, you know, we're looking at comp increases in the range of five to 7%. Uh, they really need to be in sort of like the three to 5% range, you know, so that that's kind of, these are what the averages are telling us. Now, I know some of these are contractual agreements may already have been committed, so obviously we're not going to do anything with those, but, but that, that's sort of the mindset that I hope that people have as we're going through that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know some things you don't control, I mean, some big bumps in terms of the, the benefits. I think I've seen a lot of lines where those are going up by 20% in some cases for, for healthcare. So anyway, it's a paid you know, commercial that you know, might be hearing again. So unpaid commercial for that way. Yes. Practice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Councilor I don't have any specific questions for your two-man team, but I just, again, wanted to appreciate all that you do. I'm looking at the Visit Scarborough Maine website right now, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I should be looking at this. And I also just appreciate how much time and effort you put into it. I know I emailed Tom a frantic question and you responded at like 11 at night. <laughs> So I could get the information I was looking for. So, I mean, I really appreciate what you do and what you bring to this town. I'm looking forward to the all the all boards thing that you're organizing. So thank you. Sure. Is that the thing that you were, were gonna refer to yes. later in? Uh... Yes, sorry. Can you do it without going? Yeah. Yes, give a quick plug. Sure. 
Um, so the All Board Summit is something that uh, I have a another small committee that I deal with, which is a combination of uh, SEDCO and uh, the Chamber of Commerce. And we actually have a, um, a document that we call the vision. And one of the things that we really felt several years ago was there seemed to be maybe not some coordination between some of the committees. And maybe one of the things we could do is provide a venue for people to come share their ideas and share what they're doing each year. And so we did that for, um, I think about five years. And then obviously along comes the uh, uh, pandemic. And so we didn't, we haven't done it for the last three years, but this is um, an opportunity to invite all of the uh, different boards and committees that are part of the town come together in a forum. And this year we're really trying to work around the council goals and really give everybody an opportunity to weigh in. What are they doing? What, it, what, are each, what is each committee really doing with um, that affect those council goals? And hopefully people get to know each other. And uh, that's always a, um, a real benefit when people meet each other and they begin to collaborate. And that, that happens when you bring people, people together. You have selected June eighth. I think we're yes. still working on a venue. To, yes, to we are. One of those. I was gonna. I was gonna ask if you had picked a date yet. So great. June eighth. That's very exciting. I'm glad that we're able to do yeah. things like that. Again. More to come as those details right. emerge. Excellent. Uh, I, like I say, your budget is typically very uh, not uninteresting, but you're you're always under three percent. You always hit your numbers. It's not. Uh, it, you have a degree increase. Be typical. Um, I, how do you? How does your cola work for Seco? Do you try to follow town staff, or we take everything from the the town provided us with the? We follow the same benefits and the same okay. step process. We're part of the the internal staffing, so we get our numbers from. Uh, mm -hmm. So to be consistent services. with other areas of, right. of the town, right, right. That's not our our board didn't make that decision. Uh, the town did. Okay. Well. That was it. I didn't have any other questions. Good job. And I, you know, like, you know, my counselors have also said, you are able to be involved in an awful lot for a crew of two, and you, and it's very impactful. Just looking at the work that you did to uh, to usher our comp plan through, for example, is, uh, you know, it's just volumes of work, and and that's just a, you know, small piece of what you do. So, great. Happy, happy that you're there. Yeah. Thank you. Just small appearance here. I should mention there have been a couple of questions around the issue of uh, funding. I'm proposing that we fund the full yeah. cost of FEDCO uh, using TIF proceeds from the highest TIF, and uh, I switch that from the current year, which is the downtown TIF. Um, both TIFs, uh, economic development efforts are uh, qualified uses, so I think they're and. and we can get into that now as to why I've switched that this year, but um, I just want to be clear that the source of support, financial support, is through TIF revenues. Yeah, I think that's a good. Uh, I, I don't know that there's going to be a better opportunity. Maybe there will be to, to but to explain that. Do uh, you want to try? Sure. Uh, again, uh, in the current year, uh, we're using downtown TIF revenues. Um, frankly, for the entire time. Uh, both the downtown and Highgus, which is much older, uh, has been in existence. We could have used resources, TIF resources, to fund whole or in part uh, economic development efforts. Uh, frankly, we had other needs that were greater uh, in the Highgus Parkway. We had a uh, majority of that money was committed through a credit enhancement agreement, which expires this current year. So all of a sudden, we have re TIF resources uh, that are no longer committed to outside entities. Uh, beyond that, our uh, debt has been retired for the highest TIF. Uh, we now have the matter of the interfund loan, if you will, or deficit to address. Um, and so I switched it from downtown to highest is really because we have uh, five more years on highest and uh, we don't have enough qualified uses, uh, frankly, to, to spend all that money. So I figured let's use it for SEDCO uh, while we can. So that's the point that I wanted to, I, I, there have been a number of questions, but so this isn't free money, the, the downtown, tip, right? So the, 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 uh, any increased value in these different tax increment financing districts is tossed into a fund. <clears throat> and uh, the fact that we capture all of that gives us some benefits from the different state revenue 
formulas. But if we can't, if we don't have valid uses for those funds, then it's just going into the fund and it's not coming out. It's not doing anybody any good. So the the objective is really to have valid, you know, Seiko's not new. Uh, uh, it's always been funded by the taxpayers. It still is. It's just that now because we're doing it this way, we're going to get 58 cents on the dollar back from the state um, for Seiko expenses um, over time. Yeah, I know this is so we're in a, in a good spot. We're starting to actually see some benefits, uh, you know, and it's taken a couple of years for us to get to, to that point as a town. Uh, so good news there. I would think over time, however, I look forward to us having a more robust discussion of the process we will be following for determining where those amounts go, especially as they become larger, you know, rather than deferring, you know, solely to Tom to recommend where they should go. So, and I know that's a, a longer conversation. I, I, I agree. And that's one of the areas that I'm trying to make a little more transparent in the budget order, you know, with what we actually approve as a council, we're calling, you know, looking to call out some of those items. Yeah. Um, I think it does make sense to, to be explicit mm -hmm. um, about them. So good. We I'll say the downtown tip is the one that has the most forward lead time, if you will, and likely the mo most of the complication. Uh, there. There's mm -hmm. a lot of moving parts. So in this budget last year, and then in this budget, uh, we have included exhibits to start to build that kind of history, that sources and uses history. And we fully appreciate that we need to continue that and expand upon that as it gets more complex going forward. A golden plated problem. Oh, <laughs> fair enough. What was that? Golden plated problem. Mm. Maybe maybe platinum, silver. <laughs> That's a good problem. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Karen. I appreciate it. Uh, next up is Public Works. Feel free to spread out, you know, wherever you like to sit. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if all of you have met uh, oh, Doug Howard. I beg your pardon. Pleasure to meet you. I'm John. Nice to meet you. Nice. I have yeah. met Councilor Shu. Thank you very much. Just by way of uh, background and history, and forgive me, Doug, if I don't recall all of it, but most recently, Doug uh, comes to us from uh, being public works director in South Portland for about 10 years. Correct. Correct. Prior to that, in Saco in a various and various uh, capacities. Yep, I was the fleet manager, environmental, uh, SOAR manager, uh, collection systems manager, uh, operations manager for several years down in Saco. And before that, I had done 20 years prior in South Portland before going to Saco. Wow. So I've been in the field a long time. I've been here in Saco, uh, Saco, forgive me, Scarborough for a little over six months now. Um, so I'm, I'm Relying on Steve Buckley here to, to kind of walk me through this process. Uh, he's done a lot of work on the budget. Um, so he's going to kind of take the lead on the slides and, and um, kind of get me up to speed as well. Well, we're glad you're with us. Welcome. Thank you. And, and Steve, we'll try not to be too hard on you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. So uh, uh, let's go through the slides. Uh, so the overview. Um, I mean, really, we're looking at quite a substantial increase on our budget for this year. Um, I think certainly in the time that I've been in my role, this is the, one of the largest. Um, and really, um, the the budget is driven by a lot of costs that are pretty much out of our control, um, as we'll get into more in a little bit. Um, so the proposed budget is to essentially maintain the level of service that we're providing. Um, we do have... Uh, some growth um, that we have to increase our budget for. Um, but uh, the aim of this budget that we've proposed is uh, to maintain the level of service that we're providing um, year round to all our residents, as well as meet the demand from um, increased growth uh, from developments such as Scarborough Downs um, and the other ones we have seen around uh, two miles of added uh, public roads in the last couple of years. Um, and historically, I think I quoted this statistic last year, um, you know, since around the middle of the 90s, we haven't really increased our staffing levels, uh, but we have increased around 54 miles of, of public roads. So, um, you know, it is it, it is becoming a, more of a challenge to, to meet the existing and expected levels of service. Um, and some of this is, is reflected in this year's budget. Um, so for, for our main budget drivers, uh, we continue to try and 
uh, meet the infrastructure improvements, maintenance and repair needs um, that the town has, uh, as well as meet the increased road mileage um, that we have. Um, and a lot of the new, new development is uh, denser development. So denser development is more intensive on services. Um, so in terms of cost per mile, those costs do increase um, for some of this newer development. Uh, one of the largest increases we, we have, there's, there's really two that are driving this budget. The first one is we have a large uh, increase in tipping fees for both uh, MSW, municipal solid waste and recycling. Um, I think uh, recycling was around 10% increase uh, for both collection and tipping fees and the solid waste was around 9%. Uh, so those are some pretty significant increases um, on those that are largely out of our control. We have no control. Those are contractual obligations that we have uh, with both um, Casella, who does our collections and EcoMain for our tipping fees. Uh, the other significant cost increase that we have in our budget is the fuel. Um, we were very lucky for a few years. We benefited from some, some very low prices on fuel. Uh, we were around $1.88 for gasoline um, during the pandemic. And because of decreased use during the pandemic, we were able to keep those prices for uh, quite a long time. Um, but this year, um, as anyone who fills up their car knows, uh, prices have gone up pretty significantly, and unfortunately, that's had to be reflected in the budget um, for all departments. So we are looking at a, around a 65% increase on fuel costs, um, just largely based on the fact that fuel has gone up 60%, uh, and there's a very slight increase in the amount that we're using. Um, so there is definitely a significant increase uh, in fuel. And the other driver there is just that we had this incredibly low rate, uh, and so the, the increase seems extreme. Part of it is just what we're all experiencing is uh, living in society, but but the other one is that we're starting from such a low point. The, uh, the way we buy these commodities, we buy them kind of on, on the futures, if you will. Um, we yep. buy 80 to 100,000, even more gallons at a time, and the pricing is good for that quantity. And uh, the perfect recipe that, that uh, we were able to stretch it through the pandemic because you know less usage, uh, particularly on the school side. Mm -hmm. So that that extended probably well over a year further than it normally would, and uh, now we're now we're catching up. Oh. Uh, so some of the uh, other budget drivers, um, we are down around four members of staff on our operation side, and uh, we have been for uh, about twelve months now. Uh, so that has led to us an increased reliance on. Uh, contracted services, um, especially around winter maintenance. So we now have two full-time routes that we contract out. Um, that is an increase of uh, the last couple of years um, where we only had, well, we started that, doing that a few years ago. Um, and that's something that if we are unable to fill those positions, we're going to have to look at increasing um, our reliance on, on those contracted services. Um, and then finally, we're, we're heavily impacted by inflation uh, for paving and other inf infrastructure projects as well as vehicle maintenance. So much of what we do is petroleum based. So you've seen an increase in fuel costs that reflects back to paving, uh, which goes up at about the same rate um, and other infrastructure projects as well. Uh, and then the same on vehicle maintenance as well. Parts have gone up, steel's gone up. Um, so it's we're, we're at or above inflation for our cost increases on pretty much everything. Uh, so next, the economic realities. Um, many of the budget increases are outside the control of public works. Um, so I already mentioned the uh, trash, uh, MSW and recycling, uh, as well as the fuel costs. Um, you know, the solid waste that's entirely based on our tonnage um, of what residents are putting out at curbside. Uh, we have done a couple of programs in the past few years with EcoMain to try and encourage recycling. Uh, there is... Uh, a slight difference in cost of recycling versus municipal waste. Um, and a couple of years ago, uh, EcoMain did introduce a fee for contaminated loads. And that's really what we've tried to focus on because uh, we essentially get charged twice for a contaminated load. So if it's over a certain percentage, they'll reject the load for recycling. Um, and then that gets charged as trash uh, for incineration. So we've really tried to uh, cut down on those, those loads. We've got EcoMain as well as our sustainability coordinator uh, Jamie Fitch, uh, to try and cut down on those. And that, that has helped. We have seen uh, some reduction there. So that's uh, something we're trying to do there. Um, and then the other one is um, 
We're seeing uh, all parts of materials increasing at or above inflation. And the other challenge is that um, so things that we used to be able to get at a fairly short to, uh, short term basis are now taking a lot longer to procure. Uh, that's parts all the way to vehicles um, that are now taking over a year for us to actually receive uh, some of those items. So it's uh, it, we end up paying more to ensure that our frontline vehicles stay in service. Uh, so that is, is driving some of the cost increases. As I already briefly mentioned, uh, contractors are services, they do cost more than air and house plowing. Uh, we have four open positions. We have tried to fill those. Um, they're still on the website. We're advertising those. Uh, unfortunately, we're having a real challenge finding qualified candidates. We do require commercial driver's license for all those positions. And there just doesn't seem to be uh, people looking for jobs that, that have those qualifications. So we've, uh, we've really struggled. We have been lucky that we have uh, several people that. Um, formerly worked for us, retired now, that are willing to come back and help us out in the winter. And that's really helped us get us through this past winter and, and uh, the winter last year as well. Um, but that's that, that's something where we're running on borrowed time for that. They're, uh, you know, they're aging out and they're not gonna wanna do that forever. So it's, uh, uh, once they stop providing that, then we would have to look for more contractor services if we didn't fill those positions. Um, and then another um, economic reality is that winter as a whole um, is getting more expensive. Uh, we do have an increasing number of mixed participation events. Uh, so, you know, in his, historically, we could expect, you know, most of our winter storms to be at around 20 degrees. Um, and yes, we may end up with 12 inches of snow, but that requires significantly less material than a 32 degree storm that has a mix of ice and sleet, um, like we saw this winter. So that's, uh, there is a, an increase in, in cost and quantity of material that we're, we're putting out on the roads. Uh, and finally, the alignment with council goals. Uh, so we continue to invest in our infrastructure, um, really trying to make sure it is uh, resilient to um, climate change, especially around the increased um, heavy rain events that we get. Typically, you know, historically, we were looking at one inch, two inch storms. Um, during the summer, we quite often see things that are, are in excess of that. Um, four inch storms, for example, which our infrastructure really isn't designed to handle. Um, so we have um, previously to, uh, to this year's budget, we did do a, a town-wide study um, of our entire underground drainage structure. Uh, there's nothing in this year's budget for that, but we will be looking in the future to, um, based on those studies, uh, to do some improvements on, on our infrastructure. Um, we have a lot that was built in the, the 80s and 90s, it's corrugated metal pipe. It's starting to, to fail uh, and rust. So we would like to um, improve some of those, uh, those areas. The other uh, area that we're looking at is, uh, I believe it was last November, uh, we did have a, a pretty significant uh, storm that came through and we ended up, uh, Route 1 was flooded, uh, Black Point Road was flooded. Um, Spoing for Sawyer Road. So we ended up with some pretty significant flooding. Uh, those are things that we're, we're looking at. Uh, we have a couple of projects, the Spoink Road project, uh, that includes some uh, increasing of the height of the roadway to uh, increase its resilience and reduce flooding. Uh, we've been working with the, the state on Route 1 to look at the marsh crossing there, see what can be done that uh, does flood over. At a increasing uh, rate, um, so that is something that uh, certainly impacts traffic um, and going forward is something we're gonna have to, have to address. Um, and then the other area that we're looking at is uh, the uh, transportation. Um, so continue to improve pedestrian and cycle amenities. Uh, we do have in our budget proposal for um, some sidewalk maintenance funds. Uh, many of our sidewalks are built in the 90s. They haven't really had any uh, work done to them um, in that time frame. So we're looking to uh, update the, the road surface, the sidewalk surface on those. Um, and we also have uh, the spur in phase two, uh, which will increase uh, cycle uh, amenities along spur Inc road. Phase one is due to be constructed this fall, uh, which will include a pedestrian sidewalk from uh, Acorn to Pleasant Hill, which will connect uh, everyone back to Higgins Beach and the phase two will include 
um, bike lanes from Pleasant Hill Road to the Cape Line, and that's one of our most popular uh, cycle routes. Um, so that concludes my slides. So open it up to questions and discussions. Thank you. I, I'd like to uh, thank you for the great work that you do. Uh, and it's a big production. We know you have a lot of equipment, a lot of moving parts, um, big people challenge to manage. So, and I also want to thank you in particular for uh, your responsiveness. You know, I had something the other day where we're kind of wondering what Maine Water was doing, punching all these holes in Pine Point Road. So mm -hmm. thank you for, for chasing that down. I, I did want to ask you a capital question. Uh, I think you did a great job of explaining to us, you know, the fact that we do have a lot of uh, capital equipment, a lot of large equipment. Um, and this year, I know you're looking for about 1.1 million in, in terms of uh, four vehicles. And you, you, you've done a good job of kind of detailing out what they do and how, you know, how you plan to spend, use the money. That seems like a lot. I mean, your average, I guess, over over five years is, is closer to $330,000 a year in terms of what you'd spend each year. So can you help us understand why this is hitting seems to be hitting us hard, you know, this particular year. I, I can jump in a little bit. I think uh, one of them is the, the catch basin truck, which is a, which is a big ticket item. Um, they're expensive. Um, we need it. It's a, it goes out a lot during the summer. Uh, it does all our catch basin cleaning. Uh, it helps with our MS4 permits and that kind of thing. So you'll have to help me. I don't know what a cash basin is. I think of something. And um, didn't you see the video that we <laughs> made on Facebook? It was a. I have not seen it yet. Exactly I, I will, what it is. I, I'm sorry, I didn't do the. You know, the we can probably get that video. I, you obviously. know, I mean, it was a great video. <laughs> You could not answer, and I'll just go back to the video. So, <laughs> yeah. well, yeah, well, we can, we can, we can, it's, two, it's two minutes. We can, okay. we can play right here. <laughs> Ooh, shining moment. <laughs> You're farther along than I am. While that's been queued up, we uh, Public Works uh, has a, a very well established vehicle replacement schedule, and I'd love to spend time with this committee. Uh, with Public Works and, and Fire, who's the other one that has a really a robust system, uh, they can project. They've projected out really over the next twenty years what the what the replacement schedule is. And to your question, Councilor Hamill, I think this year is abnormally high because of this big ticket item. Mm -hmm. So you can look at other years, and it probably falls back more to the normal. And if I, I'd like to ask a follow up question on that. And I, you know, again, I'm just kind of like, you know displaying my ignorance about heavy equipment, but. Um, I know you follow a guideline, American Public Works Association guidelines on, you know, how often vehicles should be, you know, what their useful life is, right? Mm -hmm. And that even, even now you're exceeding what their guidelines are, uh, but they're doing it apparently safely and responsibly. So is there any chance with a vehicle like that? I mean, is it, is this the same specs as the one it's replacing or is this like a new and improved model? This would definitely be a new and improved model. Okay. I, I believe our catch basin truck is 20 plus years it old. Is. It's, it's there it is. Yeah. So, Stephen, you're going to have to forgive. You're going to have to listen to your voice. Yeah. Good video. <laughs> you're going to be a YouTube sensation. Oh, well, maybe I can't do it. Maybe I can't project it out with uh, the sound. Maybe I can ask Peter. We can queue it up. But anyway, it's on our budget portal. Maybe he looks it. <laughs> there is a video to, to Councillor Hamill's question. There is a video up there that explains. Stephen, do you want to just give the, the footnotes? We'll spare you. Sure. That'll be so the, uh, a catch basin, you're driving down the road, uh, you see the grates. That's where all, all the rainwater goes. Um, so we are required through our MS4 permit to clean those at least uh, every other year. Um, and the heavy traffic areas such as Route 1 and Payne Road, um, we do those um, every year. So we have around... So, just so you appreciate, uh, the catch basin has a, essentially a sump. So there's a, it's, it's lower than the, the pipes that, outgoing pipe. So material falls in, silt falls in, settles in and, and, and fills that over time. And what we're referring to is cleaning out that silt and debris that's caught and captured in contaminants. Um, as well, correct. That, thanks. Now, will that be affected by sea level rise? I mean, as we get higher tides and things like that, does that have any impact? Um, I mean, we certainly have some infrastructure that's within those areas, yes. Um, and 
I mean, just those storms with that is an area we use the catch basin truck for. If we have those catch basins filled up, we will certainly uh, use the catch basin truck to, uh, to go down and clean those out. Um, and as I mentioned in my, my slides, we're using more material, we use more material, and that's more that we have to clean out from the catch basins. Great. I just have two more quick questions, if I may. One is the Pine Point Area Improvement Project for 2.5 million. I'm guessing that's sidewalks and mailboxes, but could you help me understand that? It's coming to my neighborhood, so uh, and maybe Tom, you know. Yeah, I can I can take that. Um, this probably started five years ago, and this is uh, really born out of uh, failing infrastructure. You see it firsthand. Uh, the road, the sidewalks are in serious need of attention, um, but um, what, what's not readily apparent is um, to most is that there are subsurface drainage issues. In fact, virtual lack of drainage. Uh, that area is very flat. It's very hard to collect the water and be able to send it anywhere, frankly. Uh, you're at or below sea level in some cases. Um, so that, that project is really a comprehensive rebuild that, uh, that involves full drainage, uh, road reconstruction, um, as you might expect. We've not advanced that for a number of reasons, cost and complication. Uh, including, um, and have redirected resources uh, up in the Gorham area, but we still have plans that we can certainly unearth and, and, and bring back. We are aware the DOT is doing a major resurfacing, so the roadway and, and ideally sidewalk would be resurfaced, but th that is not addressing the underlying issues. It's going to make it ride, ride better and look better, uh, but that project still persists, for sure. Does that include redoing the circle? And I'm not saying, I'm not hoping that it does because that circle has survived inexplicably for many years with knock on wood without, you know, with very few You're influence. talking about this kind of the strange confluence of uh, the, Pine Point Road, yes, the, the East Grand, the, the Jones circle, Creek, and the intersection yeah. that defies explanation. I, I believe our plans did look at redesigning that to make it more efficient and, and safe, safer, but uh, it, there's no near-term plans. Uh, what you see is going to stay there for the foreseeable. The residents like it for some you know, unknown reason. So thanks. Uh, one final question. I know you do a lot of work for other towns. Could you tell us a little bit about that? And if you had an idea of what the, you know, approximate revenue is that's generated by, by that work? Yeah, so we, I can't remember how long ago we actually started that. We have been doing that for a few years. Um, so we actually just recently picked up Westbrook, um, which they have, as you imagine, quite a few, Pieces of equipment were on their on their fire side, so we were doing Westbrook, Hollis, uh, Old Orchard Beach, Kennebunk, and Wells. Great. Um, and we uh, we do charge above our, our regular rate, so we are we are making um, a little bit of uh, funding from those. Um, and I mean, just in terms of uh, rough numbers, um, I believe. I don't I apologize, I don't have it total up in front of me, but um, Westbrook is, is roughly around $15,000 a year that we're bringing in. Uh, Kennebunk, eight. Mm -hmm. uh, Wells, six. Uh, Old Orchard Beach, 12. Uh, and Hollis is another 12. So it, it's, it, it certainly helps offset our, our costs that we have um, right. for the rest of the vehicle maintenance. Great. I just encourage you to be uh, market competitive with those rates. So if you haven't looked at them, I'm going to in a while might be worth taking a look, but thanks. You guys do great work. Uh, I think we're lucky to have uh, the kind of department and scale and the size and, and the staff and equipment to do what you do. So nice job, thank you. I, I'll just say that they're not necessarily market, but what I could tell you that they are uh, based on our, our actual costs plus markup. So mm -hmm. we're certain that we're covering our costs and then some. Great. Uh, and frankly, uh, many of the reasons these folks are coming to us, one, Fire apparatus and pumping, it's particular is a speciality that's not readily available in the in the private market. Uh, they often have to travel hundreds of miles to get service. Um, and, and I think we're cost competitive. Uh, we're, we're probably cheaper than private uh, in some respects for those specialty services. So I, I need to thank Todd Souza for that because the self-funding concept kind of got stuck. It stuck okay. in my head and I thought, what the heck? Yes. No, Scarborough has really become a provider in many respects, and, and uh, I think we actually talked about this in leadership. We're very careful about choosing our partners and, and what, our, what opportunities exist for collaboration. Uh, we'll only do it when it makes sense to us and when we have capacity and it doesn't overtax uh, mm -hmm. our resources to provide for our own needs. 
Um, and in fact, uh, I think most recent example, uh, City of South Portland reached out to us regarding assessing services. Uh, and we have firsthand knowledge how difficult it is to find good, competent uh, assessing. Um, and they know we have one. Uh, We're not voting them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we evaluated that and we realized that we really didn't have the capacity and we didn't want to, particularly on the heat on the doorstep of a reval, uh, to minimize, uh, you know, we want to maximize our potential for us. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Quick question about one of the projects you guys have for like the Spurwick Road. If some of that is a state route. Do you guys get any sort of state funding or assistance when you're doing that stuff? So the the project uh, that we're doing is entirely within the, the town area. So the, the state section goes from Black Point Road uh, to just short of Ocean Avenue. Um, and the area that we're doing is from Ocean Avenue to the Cape Line, which, which is ours. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. We get a lot of emails about sidewalks and I want to just kind of understand, you know, I think we want more connectivity. We want to be able to, I live next to Blue Point School. You know, I think people want to be able to walk to the schools and I'd love to hear from you why we can't do it and like what we would need as a town so that every school and every kid had the capacity to walk out their door even after a storm and take the sidewalk to school. That is a great question. Um, it, uh, we're, we're working on uh, long-term plans right now, kind of looking at our network, see where, where it needs connectivity. Um, we definitely know some areas that are in need of repair, Pine Point Road, down by Blue Point's definitely one of them, uh, East Grand. Um, so we are looking at that long-term um, connectivity and repair. If we get into that and we get good connectivity, right now we're only plowing a, you know, a couple of miles of sidewalks. Um, and the more you build, the more we have to maintain again. And it's gonna absolutely require more people and more equipment um, to make sure we can get everybody around during the winter time. Um, it's, it's very challenging. Uh, as you know, when you plow snow, everything from the street goes onto the sidewalk. Uh, and then the sidewalk has to be cleared at, you know, basically at the end of the storm. Um, so we don't have uh, capacity right now to really uh, take on any more sidewalks as it is. Right now it's a part-time, one of our part-time employees, our temporary employees that plow sidewalks for us in the winter. It, it is an extreme challenge, um, but it would definitely take some more staffing and more, more equipment. More to, equipment. Yeah, because it move. definitely seems to be something that residents want. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be great to see maybe next year what that would look like. Because um, again, I think it's something that we have been getting feedback about that would be nice. Um, I know when I met with you guys, which was a great experience, and it was really helpful to get to know what your department does, I got the sense that you have trouble filling the positions that you currently have open. I also got the impression, or maybe you can tell me if, if do you feel like your salaries are competitive with the people around us? Or do you feel like we are having a problem with your employee retention? because you know people around us are paying higher wages do you I heard you say that you know we just don't have anyone qualified applying are they not applying because we're not offering enough pay yeah I think it's a combination of issues I, I do think our our low end on our wages might be a little bit lower than some of the other starting community uh, starting wages in some of the communities which could entice people um, but I am hearing this from several other communities they're also having trouble hiring CDL drivers. It, it's been an issue, uh, not just in our industry, but throughout. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. Um, so I think it's really, really a combination you know, of, of uh, factors that we're not even getting applicants at this point. Right, because it's, it's unfortunate that you're spending so much money on contract services, but you don't you, you can even take those funds to try to put towards what it seems like a higher salary or something. It's much better to do it in-house. We could have a, a lot more control over it. Right. Uh, they take a lot more pride in their work. Um, and, and I'm not knocking our contract. It's, the guys that came in this year did a great job for us. They were reliable and they did a good job, but it's much easier to, to manage and handle in-house. Our contract with our operations crew will be up uh, is up at the end of June. Is that right? Next year. So we'll be engaging, re-engaging with them, uh, you know, in the not too distant future. And I, certain wages will be a central part of that conversation. Yeah. A uh, quick question for you. I, I don't mean to interrupt. Do you have other questions? That does raise a question. I know we have a, a newly organized 
uh, unit of Teamsters, maintenance workers. Can you tell me how that group is doing? I know it took us a couple of years to get them in the first contract. How, how are they doing? Uh, they're doing better. Um, I think they're understanding now what it is to be in a union and that you're, you know, you're guided by a contract or, or obligated to a contract. Um, I think they're um, really coming along and, and trying to work with us to, um, you know, to make it a good place to work. And, and so everybody, uh, you know, is happy and, and, and that'll help, you know, bring people in as well. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I will just say that Stephen did a tremendous job as interim director, um, helping manage some of those really challenging times mm -hmm. and um, really settling into a new relationship and environment. And, and then really with, with Doug coming on, I think we had an opportunity for kind of a, just a, a new relationship. And um, from my perspective, things have, have really improved um, with Stephen's help during the transition and now Doug on, on, on the team. Great. My last question is, I, I before I inaccurately said that we have 70 square miles, we have 47.6 square miles of land in Scarborough and a population of probably close to 22,000. Do you feel like that your department, despite these four staff shortages, I mean, do you feel like your department is the proper size for a town with this population and this land? Um, no. I, I definitely think our department needs to grow and, you know, to, to service, to, to keep our level of service or even improve our level of service over the years. I, I do definitely think we need to grow. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any new FTE in this budget? We do not. I, um, I notice your, your wages and benefits are going up less than most other departments. Yeah, we felt, kind of felt we really needed to concentrate on getting these four positions filled, and then we can move forward with um, additional uh, employees as needed. But our, our goal right now is to get these positions filled. So you have four open positions, and a year ago you had, I think, four open positions or some. Yeah, I think we have added a couple in since last year, but yeah. So you, you, you are same. filling them, and, and there's some turnover happening. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so I guess one of my, and most people probably won't care about this, but one of the things I would like to understand better is the, uh, both how you charge, how uh, the services we provide to other communities are represented in the budget. Like for example, I, you just uh, reeled off some numbers. I assume those were labor related. When we buy parts for, to service old order trucks, do we spend the money first and then charge that back plus some or, we we do yes i mean we we do obviously purchase them um and then we charge it back at a 25 percent markup um for items under five thousand, i think it is and then anything under that there is an additional charge um because we are incurring the cost first obviously to to purchase those uh, but there is a markup now taking on westbrook did you so are there more like supplies or or whatnot or parts in this year's budget to help accommodate that growth or is it more you buy as you need it we buy as we need it um and as a lot of these are uh, fire apparatus um obviously there's, there's a lot of crossover between what scarborough has for equipment and what uh, other towns have so we um you know a lot of it we already have in stock we're just using what we have in stock and then purchasing new stock to replace that um so there really isn't too much uh um beyond kind of what we've projected for for their budget lines that, that that we're adding by by having those towns on um, and maintaining their vehicles. Um, there, there is a lot of crossover. So that's good. So 25% markup, that will cover things like overhead, your your salaries and the right. facilities. And, okay. Um, the, the other intra-governmental piece is, I, I know that fuel's going up a lot um, and we're seeing it in your budget, but we're also seeing it in like the police department, the school budget. So we're in a way we're double counting it because it all, um, they're paying you for it. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're funding those expenses twice. So I, what I'm trying to get my arms around is how much is it really going up um, for things like parts and labor that, that we provide to other departments and then vehicle fuel. And if there's other services that you provide to other departments, I'd, I'd like to understand that better as well. Um, right now, there's a, a, a single number in the, as a revenue for you guys. It's around 1.5, 1.6 million. If you have supporting detail for that, I would be interested. 
I, we can certainly provide our, our revenue sheet that we do. Um, all of our parts, fuel, and vehicle maintenance labor is, we, we generate that from the other departments. That's what they um, submit to us every year. Um, and, you know, for things like fuel, we can predict that based on usage. Um, it's pretty consistent for every department every year. Um, so that's, what we're looking at usage for that. And then, um, for labor materials, really where, um, you know, if, if we're expecting a, a major service on a piece of equipment, something like that, that's always going to fluctuate from year to year. But again, that's that's generated from the department with input from our vehicle maintenance department, um, just to know what's coming up in the next year. Um, but everything that is reflected in our expenditure for this vehicle maintenance related should have a, an offset from another department. Um, and then obviously we public works has its own equipment as well that we have to maintain. So there's um, a little bit there that we have to uh, cover with that budget. And do we mark up uh, when we provide services to uh, other town departments, or do we just? So the internal departments that charge that cost, uh, it's the other towns that we're marking. Okay, up. okay, that's helpful. Um, yeah, you know, sidewalks has come up. Uh, Quite a lot. I, I didn't know. We only have one person that plows all our sidewalks. We, yeah, one. Uh, he's a temporary employee. Basically, works twenty hours a week over the winter months. He actually today was his last day. He uh, he's headed back north now, um, but he is planning to be back next year. And he does go out and, and takes care of the sidewalks. We do have a couple others that are trained in house um, that can go out and are willing to do that when when absolutely needed. If we really get into a bind, um, most of our crew. Again, they're working all night and all day. Uh, they don't want to jump in a sidewalk plow when they're done because a lot of that does have to be done at the at the tail end of the storm. So they're already too tired. So let's say we wanted to expand the, the clearing of sidewalks. Um, could you even fill a position that position? Do you, right. yeah. It sounds like we're, we're we're kind of lucky to have somebody who's willing to do it yeah. part time and very very lucky to have somebody do it. That doesn't require a CDL. Uh, to drive a sidewalk plow, the, the, the weight of the equipment um, doesn't require a CDL, so it might be a little bit easier to fill a position like that if, if it was designed around the sidewalk plowing. It, it, uh, when I was in South Portland, we, we plowed almost 40 miles of sidewalk, and we had four machines, five machines go out, and it would still take two or three days to get through everything. I'd also just add that that piece of equipment, while it's small, is quite expensive. And um, the history to this was uh, until a few years ago, this was a contracted service. And I think the annual cost was something in the neighborhood of 80, 80 or ninety thousand dollars. It was. Even made. Yeah. Um, that piece of equipment is a, a three hundred. I think it's a three hundred thousand uh, dollar plus. It's it's not quite that much. We so we have two machines. Um, they were around one hundred eighty thousand dollars each. So we we purchased the last one um, last year. Uh, last year's budget um but yeah so up until uh three years ago it was a contracted service uh we had a long long um existing relationship with the contractor and unfortunately they were looking at their costs and it, they, what we were paying them just wasn't uh wasn't covering their expenses uh we did initially try putting that out to a contracted bid um but mm -hmm. the numbers that we were looking at were around two hundred thousand dollars a year for which we can buy a new machine every year so it was we at that point we like to do it in-house um yeah, and the machine can be used there are different attachments for it so it can be used in the summertime as well for sweeping sidewalks and that kind of thing which we're, we're gearing up to do some of that uh, for the next few weeks this past winter we did expand our winter maintenance uh, in the area of blue point school actually right. um, yeah. And to your point, we're so geographically spread out. Uh, this piece of equipment, you know, doesn't get trailered. It, you actually drive it uh, to these locations. So, yeah. uh, you're though there's there's a lot of work on Route One in the Tunston area, all the way to the Soccer Line. You need to drive it all the way down Pine Point Road to get to the sidewalk that starts somewhere in the vicinity of the board, Blue Point School. So it's just there's travel time and expense uh, just getting from point to point. So. <clears throat> Do you get feedback from residents? Is there like uh, where do you keep priorities? Or, or, or there, I, I saw your your capital improvement plan. There was nothing, I guess, earth shattering. The big ticket item was the the, the truck. Um, is there something missing that 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 you guys need that isn't reflected in this plan or budget? Um, 
that, that's another good question. I think we need to dive deeper into our sidewalk and our sidewalk network and, and see what we have out there and see where we need to go with this um, before we can really answer that, that question, mm -hmm. you know, you know in, in, a, in a responsible way. Very good. I think you kind of did, you did answer it there. <laughs> it sounded very responsible. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys both for coming. Uh, good job. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Remarkably, we're actually right on time. Good minute. Thank you. Now. Thank you. It's kind of scary, John. It's all part of the right. Right. So, John, I might suggest that you just skip over Liam and I, just because we can plug and play whenever it works for you. If you want to take up, uh, I know we have IT here. We've, uh, so, testing, planning, and yes, we'll start it. You want to start at IT? That'd be great. I think we can we can probably skip over finance and collections because I know Norm's going to be with us at the future date. Sure. Um, if <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're not skipping over you, if, if time allows, we'll do it. Um, okay. Hello. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, so I interpreted that the um, categories of slides are sort of open to interpretation, and I interpreted the overview as an overview of the department. Okay. So we'll start there, and then I'll give you an overview of the um, budget and some of our key budget drivers. So um, our department, which apologies, because some of you have heard this spiel a few times now, some haven't. So sorry, I for, actually know your name. I'm Karen. I'm sorry. I'm Jen Day. I'm the director of IT. Um, what I like to point out about the IT department is we're a little different than other departments in that we're shared services. So we actually service both the town and the school district, meaning okay. that we share not only the staff, mm -hmm. but we also share the uh, network backbone. So that's a little different than a lot of other towns around us. I think maybe Cape Elizabeth is, is the only one uh, nearby that actually has that same shared service model. That actually saves a lot of money. <laughs> Because if you think about, um, you know, my uh, my colleagues in other municipalities and districts, they have two sets of staff, right? They have an IT set of staff for the town. They have one for the school district. They have two uh, network backbones. They have, which meaning they've got servers, they've got switches, they've got routers for two segregated networks. Because we combine it, we actually share those costs. So it actually provides a lot of cost efficiencies. Um, so our staff, we have 11 people and we service uh, between 3,900 and 4,000 employees and students across 18 locations. Um, and we maintain approximately 16,000 devices that includes things like laptops, desktops, phones, projectors, web cameras, document cameras, pretty much anything that's technology related, including network infrastructure, fiber connectivity. So all your servers, switches, routers, um, you know, any racked equipment. Uh, we also oversee uh, a lot of the sort of core system applications. So uh, we are basically application specialists helping with configuration, uh, setup, and, you know, authentication, um, and then kind of troubleshooting along the way. So that would be Munis, IMC, uh, the, the big applications, and then a lot of the smaller peripheral applications that integrate into those cores. Um, we also, as I mentioned, oversee the network infrastructure, so all of the fiber throughout the town, the dark fiber, and then all of that connectivity uh, at each location. We oversee all of the end user devices. So, for example, right now we're gearing up to do uh, student collection. So we collect all 3,000 devices from the students. We inventory them, clean them up, reconfigure them, and get them ready for deployment. Uh, and then we also oversee cybersecurity, which, as you can imagine, is becoming a big, bigger and bigger piece of the pie here. Um, but that includes sort of hardening our systems, hardening the uh, perimeter, uh, you know, taking care of the network. Um, also, each individual application will review it as it's spun up uh, to make sure, you know, there's appropriate authentication and um, protection. Uh, so, as you can imagine, we have 11 people. Uh, six people are basically a full-time, uh, we, we, we allocate them as full-time school staff, 
And then uh, the other five people are split between town and school. Um, because we have so many end users, we really have a one IT staff person slash help desk person ratio to 350 end users. So just to give you an idea, in a normal complex environment, if you were to go out to a corporate environment, that ratio would actually be about one to 45. So we service a lot of people, we service a lot of devices, um, and you know, we kind of do the best we can, but we have come up with some creative ways. So I really wanna um, spotlight Ryan Marshall, who is our field tech up at the high school. That's a tough job because you can imagine there are a thousand students, there's you know, hundred staff people. Uh, and for one person to try to manage all of that and you know, service that, that huge uh, population. So he started this past year, a student help desk. And he has about five or six students, freshmen on up to seniors, who he recruited to basically be grassroots level assistants. Um, we've trained them, they go out, they help with everything. You know, if somebody can't log on to their device, uh, if they're having a problem with their projector, if they have an application problem, they help with all of that. Uh, they'll also help us with collection, device collection and deployment. Um, and it's a win-win because we actually created a, uh, a, a program with Chrissy Zvaznik where they're getting credit for, uh, for all of their work. And we also are putting them through A plus certification training. So, so far we've had two kids who have passed their A plus certification. Um, we're hoping to have a few more before the end of the year. The program's become so popular that now he has nine more applicants for next year. We're hoping to expand this so that we um, have a feeder program from the middle school and, you know, who knows, maybe on down. But um, the, the high school student help desk also has been out and helping at other grade levels as well. So it's been hugely successful. Ryan's been a rock star in starting that up. Um, and we are hoping to kind of expand that, that program just to give us a few more hot hands. Um, and then we do respond to over 4,500 help desk tickets annually. We also respond to about 2,500 direct phone calls. Um, and that's a fraction, really, you know, of the requests that we get. Because if you can imagine, uh, we get a lot of people who stop us in the hallway. We get a lot of people who call us directly, who email us, who instant message us. Um, and so I would say that number of requests is probably, you know, two thirds higher than what you see there. You're not rushing me, by the way. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh oh. My key budget drivers didn't show up in percentages. You know what they are. Okay, I do. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, so uh, we have about a hundred twenty-seven thousand dollar increase over our last year's budget, and so when well, I was going to say that the percentages you see, but the percentages you don't see that I'm going to tell you about. Um, are actually a percentage of that number and not a percentage of the overall IT budget. So of the $127,000 increase, 63% or you know, roughly $80,000 uh, is new software and applications. So what happens in our budget is when a department wants to go out and purchase an application, there's a process that we go through there. Um, and then once they, they purchase it and they pay for the implementation and basic licensing out of their department budget, and then moving forward, we absorb the ongoing costs of that. So the maintenance costs and the licensing costs. Um, so that's why you'll, you'll always see a year over year increase for us because, and that's probably always from this point forward, going to be uh, primarily software and application costs and licensing costs. Um, so those were new applications from all over everywhere, from public safety, uh, fire department, police department, dispatch. Uh, we had something from assessing. We had something from finance. So it's really sort of a mix of all different applications, which you have, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to, to answer a, a high-level overview, and then I would leave it to the individual department directors to kind of explain. Uh, we did also see a marked increase moving into FY24 of licensing costs from existing vendors. And part of what happened there was we saw during the pandemic, 
a lot of them froze their licensing costs. So now they're playing catch up because they've done that for the past two or three years. And now that we're moving into year four, we're seeing that standard, when I negotiate a software contract, I'll cap it out at between three and 5% year over year increase. And we're seeing sometimes double that. Again, they're making up for the past couple of years. Um, so that's software. Uh, then we have 32% in hardware. That unfortunately is, there's nothing that we can do about that. Uh, what happens is we negotiate multi-year contracts for different hardware maintenance. So what's coming up this coming year is a three, another a renewal of a three-year contract for our wireless access points uh, for our core switch. And then we have some backend, just infrastructure servers and whatnot that, that need to be re-upped for maintenance. So that's the 32% there. 5% of it is department requests. This is pretty standard year over year as well. It's if you bring on a new person and you need a laptop or you need a desktop. Um, and then there is a request from, uh, from finance for a cashiering program that actually is going to facilitate uh, online payments. Uh, pretty much almost 100% online payments. Um, so that, that takes care of the department requests. Those are pretty much the, the budget drivers. Um, CapEx, I didn't put in here. I didn't know if we were talking about that on a different day or... It's fair game. Fair game? Okay. So we, it's pretty minimal, our request. I think it's a total of about $75,000. Um, telecom switch replacement. So we have uh, between 15 and 18 telecom pump switches that are hitting end of life. So again, it's just kind of one of those things that you can't avoid. We're gonna to have to replace them if we want phones. Uh, power source for the server room. So that basically is a giant battery, right? It's an un uninterruptible power source, a UPS. And what that does is if you have some kind of power outage or power surge or blip, that thing kicks on to maintain the power between the the surge and the time the uh, generator comes on. That's hitting end of life as well next year. So we have to replace that. And then we do have a, a small amount in there for cybersecurity expansion. So right now what we have in place is a um, monitor, detect and alert, but there's no action taken on the other end. So what we're looking at is an expanded program that actually will take um, action. We define what those thresholds are um, dependent upon what the threat is or what the vulnerability is that's identified. Um, so that's a program that's, again, split between the town and school. Is that what the SOPOS and the NDR is? Right, yeah. So we have sort of a different, uh, we have a, a lower version of that, and this is kind of the next, the next version. Um, and we can get into a lot of detail about that offline if you want. I just don't like to tell the world about our cyber security. I was just curious what the was. So yeah, I need to go but I'm happy to also provide some more detail about that. Look, I love talking about that. Um, okay, so our economic realities is the same old, same old that you have heard from everybody. We have supply chain constraints. This started during the pandemic. I mean, just getting chips, getting motherboards, anything, uh, mostly out of China has been really difficult um, because they shut down for periods at a time. We're not just seeing them though with the manufacturers. We're also seeing them with the actually sh the, the shipping and delivery um, components as well. And I'll give you an example. We waited over nine months for projectors. We ordered them. They kept, oh, they're coming any day. They're coming any day. And nine months later, we finally got them. So we've <laughs> just been installing them recently. Um, we waited over five months for just a screen down at Wentworth. Um, so we're seeing this kind of backup across the board. We are trying to get orders in as soon as we can so that we can get them in time, you know, over the summer to make sure that we get them configured and, and ready for deployment. Um, we're seeing, you know, due partly to that supply and demand, right? So your supply goes up, your demand goes up, your supply goes down. We're seeing uh, inflation pricing that, that is um, skyrocketing in some areas, but definitely increasing in others. Um, and definitely energy costs, I think, are playing into that, what it's, what it's costing folks to actually manufacture and then ship the devices themselves. Um, staffing and retention, we actually have been very lucky over the past two years that we have really seen very little attrition on our staff. Retention is something that keeps me awake at night because with an IT staff, you know, post-pandemic, 
people like to just, you know, particularly in IT, they work from home in their jammies. So I, I always worry about that because a lot of the positions that we have require that you be on site, particularly when you're deployed out to the school. Um, and then cybersecurity is probably something you're not going to hear from everybody else about economic realities. But, you know, cybersecurity, we constantly see an uptick in phishing, spear phishing, um, you know, credential stuffing, uh, supply chain attacks, ransomware, you name it. And as soon as you close down one vulnerability, you know, the, the, the bad actors are out there creating more threats. Um, so we are having to spend more money, more time, more resources in trying to protect the assets of the town. Oh, something else I want to mention about cybersecurity too is um, we are seeing an increase in pressure from both state and federal regulatory bodies to make sure that we have hardened systems, um, to make sure that we have adequately trained staff, to make sure that we're doing things like routine phishing tests. Um, so those are things that we have had to spend you know, time and money on. And we also are seeing the same kind of pressure from our cybersecurity uh, insurance provider. So we, I've filled out more questionnaires in the last year, I think, than I have in the course of my career at the municipality. Now, having come from the financial sector, I can tell you that I know what's coming down the pike in terms of regulatory requirements, and we just need to start preparing ourselves. So we have started to put some things in place, having an incident response plan, um, having disaster recovery, you know, uh, um, practice sessions, things like that. Um, but I know that there are going to be some other things that they're going to require us to do that, again, are probably going to require some time, money, and resources. Um, so align with the council goals. This was a hard one for us because, you know, we don't specifically align with, you know, goal number one and goal number five. Um, what we do do, though, is support the entire effort across the board. We provide that foundation because um, it's always good to have things like email and internet and phones. Without that, you know, it's, it's hard to do business now. Um, so we have made some strides over the past couple of years uh, to specifically increase bandwidth. We'll be doing that over the next couple of months. Um, and that's in uh, conjunction with MSLN. They are offering us significantly increased bandwidth, but to do that, we have to um, swap out some of our switches. Um, so always trying to ensure adequate capacity for the town and school. Um, we have upgraded our infrastructure. So we constantly are cycling through switches and routers and servers and, you know, uh, replacing cabling and, you know, whatever we have to do to keep, keep everything running. Um, we've been trying to, as I mentioned before, harden security and then improve our redundancy. So make sure that we have really more than adequate um, recovery time objectives, recovery point objectives, make sure everything's backed up. Uh, we're doing it segmented. Um, and, you know, we, we can actually also recover in terms of connectivity. Um, we already talked about expanding cybersecurity capabilities. So always trying to minimize that attack surface and minimize the attack vectors, um, scanning and monitoring our network and trying to close down, identify and close down vulnerabilities, secure endpoints because we are responsible. As I mentioned, for all of those devices that we manage, we're responsible for securing security on there. Um, We've been implementing multi-factor authentication across the board for uh, folks who have access to um, personally identifiable information. Um, and then we support all of the department's technology needs. So everything from you know, going through a vetting process with them for new software to identifying you know, any kind of hardware or other solutions that they might need. So I think that's sort of how we align with just the general council slash schools slash board of education slash school district goals. <clears throat> Questions and discussion. Nice job. Thank you. No questions. No, I think uh, I've been impressed. I, it seems like we were just here, uh, you know, it was a year ago, but it seemed like it was not that long ago. But I, you know, I, uh, this year, as, as in prior years, I'm impressed at, uh, you know, what you do with a small group and the scope of your responsibilities. So, um, so I think the budget looks fine. I mean, you know, and I think that you, you run a tight ship. So, 
So thanks. No questions. I just wanted to acknowledge that I think the student help desk program sounds really like a great idea. And it's great to hear that it's, it's growing and it seems to be catching on. Seems like it would be continuing and growing program. So good job. I agree. That's a phenomenal idea. Um, so I'm not going to let you off completely off the hook. I'll ask a couple of questions. Um, so when Tom buys a laptop, mm -hmm. not that he ever does, uh, does that go on his budget or your budget? So uh, around December-ish, actually it's been later this year. So like I'll say February, I send out an email uh, to all the department heads and I say, what are you guys looking at for technology needs for next year? And they will say, I need three laptops. I have people coming on board or I need an owl or I need two, you know, side-by-side -side large monitors or whatever it is. Um, and then we kind of work with each department head who identifies a need and we vet the whole process with them. Do they really need it? What exactly do they need? How is this compatible with what we have? Um, are there peripherals that are going to be required? So you get a monitor, you probably need a HDMI cord or, you know, whatever with that. So we kind of vet all of that. And then that's included in the IT budget. If something comes up during the year, if Tom breaks his laptop, um, that probably comes mm -hmm. out of Tom's mm -hmm. budget or wallet. Or <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I don't know. Fair enough. Your budget just looks too small. So all the, the 3,000 or however many devices it was for the school department in the town, that all is flown, all goes through your budget. It does. I tend to buy devices with accidental damage protection. I find that it's a really cost-effective way of doing things because, for example, if you buy a Chromebook, Chromebooks now are about 410 for us. ADP is going to run you maybe, I don't know, $35 or $40. Well, that's going to cover you for at least two years for accidental damage protection. If you crack the screen because of the way that the devices are made now, they're kind of all one shell. Um, it's a whole replacement of a device. Hmm. So you just kind of saved yourself, you know, whatever. $410, um, you know, minus depreciation over how many years you've had it. We also started this past year back with um, having families who were interested in having that coverage. They're paying $15 per year per device um, per student uh, for that ADP. So if that's damaged during the year, we replace it at no cost to the family the first time and then the second time. Um, you know, so anyway, we're, we're, we started that up. We got away from doing that during the pandemic and then we kind of started that, that up. I don't like to use the word insurance because that, that's, <laughs> that, that's not really what it is, but yeah, but it's, it, it's just sort of a, a fund to, to help everybody um, kind of pay into the same pot. Now the, I don't know if I'm saying this right, the CAD system that the police or department has been evaluating. Yeah. Have you been engaged or involved in that process? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, but that will be under their budget initially and then the recurring costs would, yeah. would move to you? Okay. Maintenance will move in. Starting to get up. I think that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. No, and Jen's done a tremendous job to kind of uh, pull all of this and centralize both software and hardware. Not too long ago, um, Departments were kind of left to their own, or I shouldn't say that. Uh, IT was always kind of around and available, but many departments would kind of go on their own. And you might expect uh, some had better capabilities than others. Uh, we certainly weren't able to enjoy some, some uh, economies of scale by everyone kind of going off and doing their own thing, and there were compatibility issues for by all that. So, um, and, and Jen is, and, her, and her team have really demonstrated to the staff that they're resources that should be relied on. If this isn't a burden. We're here to help you to make sure we understand what, well, in many cases, help us understand what we need because uh, we might think so, but we don't really know. And it's never been more true uh, with this incredibly elaborate vetting process for this, uh, this CAD system for dispatch. A huge, huge pur purchase that's likely to be with us for 10 or 20 years mm -hmm. or something like that, long time. Um, and once you make uh, make a uh, commitment with with one of these major four systems, um, it's really hard to reverse in course. So uh, Jen has really done a great job of doing that um, um, kind of needs assessment to make sure we understand what what they actually needed to perform, and then working through the vendor process. And uh, just in the last two weeks, have actually made a 
an award uh, decision. Yeah. Is there a standard device? I mean, a standard issue device for for staff and for students, the same thing or? Yeah, uh, the standard device is different at each phase level for students. Um, the staff on the school side have a fairly standard device. Of course, it depends on the cycle that we roll it out. So for example, we just rolled out new devices for K through five. Mm -hmm those will all be the same, but they're not the same as, you know, what we rolled out two years ago because we couldn't get that model. So um, yeah, we try to keep everything as standardized as possible, particularly because, you know, we have specific software applications um, that, you know, are Windows-based and based on a specific version of Windows or Google or whatever. So we, we really do need to kind of keep that standardized. And that's another reason why we tend to move all of the maintenance and licensing fees under IT, because then we can kind of monitor, maintain, manage that. We make sure it's compatible for sure. Um, but moving forward, you know, we do review that every single year. Do, do we have, if we're going to be audited by Google, do we have enough licenses? Because you don't want to get caught not having enough. Um, so it's that kind of thing. We, we kind of do our own internal audit on that at least once or twice a year. What do you do with your uh, the units that you take out of service? You said you're replacing the K to five machines. Yeah. So to be honest with you, by the time they roll out of service, they're so uh, obsolete that they're not really of use to a lot of people. We do uh, as much as we can. We clean them up and we uh, you know wipe them of any data, and then we'll send them to Roos Reusables. Um, if we can reuse them someplace we will. So we do tend to keep a stack on the shelf. So if somebody says, oh, I need a one-off machine to be in the library so I can check in students or I can check out devices or whatever, we, we have some of those that we just, instead of purchasing a new one, we just um, repurpose old machines. And we'll use some for, you know, to Frankenstein parts from if we need. Because we do most of our field techs, we've put through training um, through either, you know, Lenovo, Asus, what it, whatever manufacturer it is, so that we can fix the devices ourselves. Excellent. The numbers look good, uh, especially given the, the, the environment that we're in. Uh, mm. so. Good job. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks. All right. We're going to take a three minute break. We'll, we'll regroup at 730. And who's on deck just so we can. So when we return, we are. Well, uh, why don't we go to assessing? Okay, thank you. Because you've been here for almost three hours, so.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. We are going to uh, reconvene. It's about seven thirty-three, and we're moving on to the session department. And the courier is joining us to uh, to go through the, your package. Nick, take it away. Thanks. Um, like was mentioned about at least one other smaller department, uh, I'm usually one of the less interesting ones. And in this context, that's a good thing. It means we have a small budget that's mostly our staff's wages. And we currently have uh, four full-time staff. And despite the increase in uh, past due to growth in town and due to different state programs, we're able to do a great job with those four people. Um, so year to year, um, other than the, those costs, there's relatively minimal other costs in our budget, like office supplies and uh, you know reimbursement for mileage or things like that. So those are pretty normative. Only 6% of our budget is not related to wages and benefits. Uh, one uh, notable thing this year that is above and beyond that would be uh, $44,000 that's been included in the assessing department budget for a proposed townwide revaluation project. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, the budget drivers, like I mentioned, you know, uh, mostly due to uh, staff wages. So everyone's COLA increases or benefits, you'd see that normative percentage. But the uh, townwide revaluation project costs, they're listed right there. They're fairly simple. And compared to um, when it was done in 2019, uh, a lot more modest uh, because the, when performed by an outside company uh, in 2019, the costs were nearly 400,000. So we're projecting that 44,000 when done in-house by the town of Scarborough assessing staff led by myself uh, will be sufficient uh, to cover the needs uh, in addition to us doing all the work. How and were you able to do that? I mean, it seems like a giant. I've uh, over the last few years learned what it uh, takes to be able to do the statistical analysis. And I'm still learning, working with um, different professionals that have done this before to uh, make sure I know the software and the methodology. Okay. And then furthermore, um, in the 2019 revaluation, there was it was what's considered a full measure and list. So they went to everyone's house. Once you have that inventory of data, that's very good. And you continue to improve it over the years. Uh, you don't need to go to everyone's house again. Just a sample of properties uh, for recent sales to verify the data. But then you this time around, do a statistical analysis of sales data and income and expense data for commercial properties and are able to do it with um, more uh, computer analysis. Uh, so that's why I'm able to do it. Thank goodness, because the last one was a heavy lift. And yeah. It was painful. We're hoping it'll be less painful this time. Uh, uh, I'll speak more about that in the months to come, but uh, just while we're on that topic, because it's the only thing of interest that I have to say tonight uh, for our budget, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to make it as such uh, to keep move things along. Um, we we know that the last one uh, people said we wish we were more informed and better communicated with. So we've already started a communication plan, uh, not to be uh, you know. Uh, overdone by other people like Stephen Buckley's great video on the catch basin truck. We have one coming out later this week for the revaluation because we want people to know it's in the pipeline. Uh, and also there's a landing page on the assessing website of the town website uh, that has uh, some of the information already there and more to come in the uh, month uh, of May. So the last thing on that slide, all, all it said was, if it weren't for the revaluation cost, uh, our increase would have only been 3.7% in our annual budget if you were to exclude the revaluation 44,000. So the uh, council goals that we're in alignment with is the financial health of the town. That's the backbone of what we do, uh, ensure the property tax revenue from all the residents and owners of property is uh, distributed fairly and equitably among everybody and complying with the state laws. Uh, one reason why, uh, among others, uh, to perform a revaluation in-house is because uh, when the assessed values and the sales prices go out of alignment uh, and are no longer reflective of each other, the uh, state audits us and uh, develops what's called a certified ratio based on that assessed to sale 
balance from two years ago, so 2020 to 2020, uh, 2021. And the ratio for that year was 85%, meaning our assessed values were only 85% of the sale prices on average. Uh, and then they allow us to uh, change that within 10%. And so we're, we're going with fiscal year 24, 10% above that 85% will be 94% we're allowed to certify at with the state. And what that means is all of our reimbursements for exemptions like the homestead exemption, the Betty exemption for business uh, tax exemptions, will get 94% of what we would have been eligible for otherwise. So uh, just a rough number, that's about 200,000 uh, dollars that we will not get from the state. Um, the, the bigger thing is that every year we don't do a revaluation, that number will continue, uh, the ratio will continue to decrease and our funding will continue to decrease. And uh, that also gets passed along to the taxpayers. Uh, the homestead exemption this uh, coming year will be reduced by that same percentage. So instead of a $25,000 homestead exemption, it'll be 23,500. So that translates to $24 less that they could have saved, but the pain will get worse with each consecutive year we don't deal with this. So um, we've been talking about this right along since the last one. Mm -hmm. I became the assessor um, uh, late in 2019 following the last revaluation. And you know, within months of me being here, we're talking about uh, what are we gonna do differently next time? And we pushed it off a year, so it'd make five years from the last one. And the state requires us to do it every 10 years, but we're trying to get ahead of it so we don't continue to lose funding or uh, have inequities amongst tax pay taxpayers. And you might recall, uh, Nick approached the, the council last year, uh, fully prepared to move forward with Reval, but came with a recommendation given some of the, what appeared to be uniqueness and particularly the residential market and maybe some Aberration, we don't know. Uh, we didn't think it was the best time, maybe the kind of the high water mark to be doing this, let things settle out. And here we are. We think we're at a point where we can actually, the market has kind of corrected itself a bit. Uh, and I think it is where it is. And, and we're at a point where we can look at this. And this is not a budget question, but is there a, a, you know, sort of a best practice in terms of what the cycle should be for reassessments? Or is that some that depend on the town's profile? It certainly would depend on the town's profile and appetite for it, but I think the more frequently and routine a town does it, the better, because it will minimize the impact uh, and uh, span of how much a property will change. And um, it also makes sure that any inequities, if certain properties increase more in value than others, that people keep paying their fair share of the taxes. The longer you let that go out of alignment, uh, it could be a problem. So it's advisable to do it sooner rather than later. Nick, uh, I asked Councillor Katarina about this the other day, but it seems to me with the uh, kind of crazy real estate market that we've had, most communities are gonna be in the penalty. Um, have you seen any movement from the legislator to, to waive this penalty because of the environment that we're in? No, I, I haven't. And what I've seen is the opposite. Most municipalities performing a revaluation uh, to become back in alignment with the state requirements because um, not only do you lose the funding, but if you go below a 70% certified ratio, which we very well could in three years from now because it lags two years, um, then you're required to do it anyway. So some towns are already required to do it, so they're doing it, but we're trying to do it two or three years before we must do it as mandated by the state. So it's on our terms, not a rush job. You know, we've been planning for this so we can do it methodically and thoughtfully. Yeah. I just wanted to complete the next point uh, regarding the uh, state reimbursements for uh, and exemptions. We have, based on his direction, provided for those lower amounts uh, in the budget as well. Yeah, so what's in the budget already reflects that lesser amount based on 94%, not 100% of state reimbursements. Very good. Was that the end of your slide deck? It was, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Councilor, questions? Great work, and we're glad you're here. And um, it, it's, it's been interesting to hear you. Uh, I know when we first had the, la the last big one, I think it was eight years we had since we had done the one prior to that. Oh, longer than that. 15, 14, 14 which 15. is 
Yeah, too long. So, I mean, that was, uh, after that experience, people thought, well, why don't we do it every year or two? And then you, you recommended that we not do it that frequently. And I, because I was really interested in um, how you determined that we should do it that way. Mm -hmm. Really? No, I think you asked the question that I was, I was wondering what the last one was before 2019. And you're saying it was 15 years. Before. 2005, I believe, which is fine. Even though the state says you're supposed to do it every 10 years, yeah. And I, I guess I didn't know, because I know people, for me, I've lived here for 17 years. I was like, you want to do another one again? Mm -hmm. And I just didn't know what is standard for a town this size, or is it because we're growing so much, or is it just the market's nuts? I didn't know if there's like some predictability behind what your method is for residents looking forward that we could set a schedule of like, you know, we're doing this every three years, be prepared, this is happening. I, I just didn't know. Yeah, I had originally uh, proposed every three years, but it's so uh, taxing, uh, I guess that's a funny term to use in this instance. But, uh, um, uh, there's so much involved in it and it's hard on people to undergo that process and the questions involved that five years, uh, pending any necessity to do it otherwise is reasonable. And we, and we really had a, a, an overheated residential market. Um, so it, again, I don't think it makes sense to set values at what might be the high water mark, if you will. Uh, and I think, again, we've kind of, the market's starting to level out and settle out and really be predictive of the, of the future. So I can't wait to watch your video. Sure. It's uh, brief, but there will be several more to come uh, for better or for worse. <laughs> um, I want to, I, I think revals confuse, are confusing for people. One thing I, I just wanted to throw out there is, is if every property in town is going up 25%, your tax bill is going to stay about the same. It's going to go up about the standard 3%. That's Where correct. there's disconnects is if your property is now worth 50% more and Don's property is only worth 20% more. Well, your taxes are going to go up a lot more than Don's. Don's might not even go down. Um, so I don't know if you have a feel for how much, you know, how values have been moving. What you, I, one of my favorite parts of being a counselor is actually reading your report um, that you sent out after commitment. I think there's a lot of just really good data in there. Um, do you have a sense for it, are, are residential property owners going to be impacted more negatively due to the reval than commercial or? Rather than ju uh, just uh, say it, you know, offhand right now, I'd suggest uh, that when the council desires, we have a workshop on the matter so I can go more in depth and not misspeak, but rather give it the time it might deserve. Oh, good plug. All right. I well done, Nick. Workshop. Well done. <laughs> I'll await uh, you asking for such a workshop. I'm happy to help with that. Very good. Thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, thank you. The final plug is he's leaving. Nick has been invaluable to me. Uh, we talked about complexity of tips. Uh, a lot of it comes through his office. He's been tremendous in terms of setting up systems to uh, handle just the, the volume. Um, just appreciate uh, the downtown tip. I don't know how many parcels it started with, but the Downs property alone was a single parcel. Every time they subdivide, it's, it's a new parcel. And so over time, there'll be thousands of parcels. Um, as we proceed and so you need to track those all individually so there's a lot of important work done uh um, that nick's done up front that i think is going to serve us well going forward so, so is you exhibit five and six or yep that's, next that's you okay the only question i have is there any disclosure here the fact that you both have the same name same last name? no really we, we pronounce it differently name. so that's our safety there yeah sorry yeah <laughs> thank you thanks thanks, thanks. Oh, Nick, are you fully staffed now? Yes. Uh, okay, next up. Uh, we have planning. Are you guys tag teaming? I have planning engineering, or are you going separately? When we go planning. Credit for that loss. Put the time slide back up. Where did you So planning and codes are together. Yes, planning and codes. Planning and codes. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. So for my overview, I did much like Jen, and I just provided an overview, especially now that the divisions have been separated a bit. Uh, we just have planning and codes. And so we are the primary staff liaisons to planning board, ZBA, and the Long Range Planning Committee. We process all development review um, applications. We process all building permits. We do all the building inspections. Uh, we manage the rate of growth permit 
um, calculations uh, and all long range planning. And we implement the comprehensive plan. We have uh, seven full time staff and then one part time plans reviewer. Our primary budget drivers, and I think you all have figured this out, engineering service division was removed prior to me getting here, so I can't really take any credit for it, but it does make my budget look really nice. Um, our primary budget drivers in this are our personnel costs and the training. We have certifications that must be maintained on an annual basis for our CEOs. Um, legal reviews, we spend quite a bit of money making sure that the things that we bring forward um, are up to snuff and legal and the documents and the ordinances that we look at. And then public notices and mailings. Those expenses have gone up a bit. We, we put public notices out. We do probably around 100 um, site plans and subdivision reviews per year, and we notice for all of those. So those are some of the things that you'll see. As far as alignment with council goals, I think I'm, I'm here quite often. Um, but residential growth management, uh, rate of growth ordinance, the zoning ordinance to for LD 2003, that's a council goal that we're currently working on. Uh, the impact fees, working with um, Todd and parks and recreation impact fees, working with Angela for traffic impact fees. And then sustainability, conservation, climate change. Um, we partner, the engineering department and planning and code still partner in those those uh, responsibilities. And so in our CIP request, uh, we have the open space plan and then the vulnerability assessment request as well uh, for discussion. But we, we work with those groups. And then for traffic and transportation, again, partnering with engineering services on the transportation master plan. So that's how we are working towards the, the council goals. I'm happy to answer any questions. So, can you Sure. So the open space plan, the whole idea is to really get some professionals that can take a look at everything that we have in the town that's available that could would be property that we will look at uh, into somehow using for open space. And that would be like passive or maybe active recreation or trails, but really identifying those places that we need to preserve and take a look at getting. We have a, um, the Conservation Commission um, had their workshop last week and there's a lot of interest in this from the Conservation Commission and then Todd's groups with Parks and Rec and then of course we have the Land Trust and so there's a lot of um, parties working on it but the open space plan would really be sort of a compilation of, uh, I, it's, it's not something that we would do at staff, we would find a consultant to do it, um, but they would take a look at everything that's available and identify those parcels and those areas where, one, it would be a, a linkage that we could use, um, two, it would be an environmental um, benefit, benefit um, habitat and different, um, any different cultural things that we want to preserve. So that's it sort of in a nutshell. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sorry to jump into the question. <laughs> Sure. Sorry. Um, so can you talk about the you, you have favorabilities uh, for both the planning office as well as your all of your other divisions right so you're you're right you're down you're only because of engineering services i see the so division that's the whole yes thing, yes the whole driver she that group took out a little piece of everything and i see yes. right um to say that you've hit the ground running would be a understatement so i'm interested in trying to find out from you that you know how have you found it here in terms of like what you know what are the challenges and and also in terms of your resources and your budget you know do you see any i've been really pleased um with what i've found and the staff um and the town in general and staff and other um departments and the leadership I, we have what we need. Uh, we have made some requests in our CIP for some software. That is something we need. Um, but our, all of our staff is on board with trying to get that into place. Um, we are currently underway in our, our move and our relocation and sort of um, redesign of our internal offices. So that's exciting. Um, and other groups in the, the town have helped with make that happen. So I've, I've been really pleased. I think we have. If we were to get those um, CIP requests and then um, 
maybe um, the open space and the vulnerability assessment approved somehow, funded somehow in the CIP request, I think we'd be in really good shape. Now, how about from the standpoint of your workforce, though, because I know there's a perception, with, especially with the volume of work and activity we have around planning and zoning and development and so forth. How do you feel about the staff that you have at the front line with enforcement? Oh, I feel really good about um, that. That's we are. I'm going to be back before you in a few years asking for obviously probably staff if we continue to grow in the way that we are um, currently but also looking at ways that we can create some internal efficiencies so that doesn't have to happen right away. Um, we do have what, about 750 permits came through our office last year and there's about a thousand inspections. Um, but that software request also creates a lot of efficiencies with that as far as um, online submittals and just, we do a lot of spreadsheets and we do a lot of things that I think takes about three times as long as it could be if it was an automated process. Um, so I think that will help us manage the growth that we'll have for quite some time. Great, thank you. The permitting software, I, when I was at the fire with the fire chief, is this the same? I, I met the inspector for the fire department. Mm -hmm. He was talking about the software that would completely bring you guys to a whole nother level. Yes. And I, I want to like appreciate that because I mean, I think his explanation, I think that if I'm, if this is the right product and what we're talking about, my understanding was this would actually serve a good purpose for the fire department as well, because this, and I don't know if this is what he was talking about is, is this manage like the plans and everything. So if they respond to a fire, they can literally pull up the building and look at it. Is that what this. It's was? possible. I probably didn't ask for that much money. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's different versions. Different, there's different, different modules and different versions. A lot of the software it's created on a module basis. So there could be add-ons, okay. but they'll be involved if, if it gets approved, they'll be involved. And, and IT is really at the forefront of finding us really good vendors so that we can get something that's um, expandable over time, perhaps. But assessing could use it for some things. We could use it for marijuana licensing, business licensing. There's a lot of different ways to go about it. So I think if um, with IT's leadership, making sure it works with everyone, I think we could really make it scalable. So and is it some of what you're talking about is actually part of the campus. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that's I'm more... trying to honestly just figure out what we're talking about. Um, so you said you had per year you had 100 site plans and then last year you had 170 permits. No, like around 750 permit and, and then that include, equates about a thousand inspections. Okay. Mm. And so you're saying that this will help you guys run more efficiently? Yes, yes. And, then, okay. and we can take online submittals so it reduces the amount of paper. We're spending, we spent quite a bit of money um, scanning and we have to maintain paper and state of Maine still requires you to, if you take paper, you have to keep paper. And so that's a big um, kind of a waste of space and time and just handling all of that. I think you've probably seen our, our planning board packets, right? And just the bags and the amount of, of those things that we have to go through. So being able to accept everything electronically would be huge. I mean, I think just generally my comments are, I, how do we get the open space and conservation plan into their budget? Um, without taking things away. That's the ultimate goal. I think our goals this year are to focus on conservation and things like that. So when I look at software to make permitting more efficient and faster, I'm like, well, let's let's see. You know, residents want us to not focus on growth and focus maybe a little bit more on our town as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate what the software will bring. I just want to find how we can get those other things into the budget. Vulnerability assessment. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. What is what is that? That one is the first step, if you will, for a climate change uh, plan. And so that one is really more of our sustainability coordinators who'll be running that project. Um, but that really takes a look at the areas and places that we need to do those improvements to make sure we're ready. Uh, for the climate and it gives us the first step and Angela may want to chime in on this as well. Uh, I can feel her back there. I, I, she's nodding. So that's, yeah. come on up. Man. Is that something that we would partner with other yes. communities on or? Um, I don't think that we would 
Well, we may. Uh, there may be some information out there that um, shared we would want a partnership yeah. with. I'm sorry. Okay. Shared infrastructure. I, I know yeah. that uh, yeah. some other towns have done a vulnerability assessment. Right. Well, didn't the DOT come down and do, they were doing route one and stuff. So we did um, in the past years, when this is dated now, worked with um, a group of communities working with Old Orchard and Saco. Um, I think at this point, we're looking at that was more of a larger zoomed out picture. Now, what um, the next step for us would really be zooming in on Scarborough and Scarborough needs, Scarborough's in infrastructure. I've had a lot of conversations with the sanitary district and their vulnerable infrastructure. Um, and just looking at, I mean, just sewer lines through the marsh I'm alone and looking at how that climate change is affecting or has potential to have some devastating impacts. We just, at some point we need to just get started. This is kind of uh, our first, as she said, first kind of baby step um, to start working towards more of like a five-year workup or plan to get us to an action plan kind of thing. So, um, and is there money available from anybody else to help support either yeah, of these? I didn't know if that's something like we could be so engineering, it, it, services, can we be creative? Yeah, I don't know. I well, yeah, I'm, I'm, well, I'm glad you it. asked because as we move forward, now that we have a approved comp plan, that was holding us up from mm -hmm. getting some state grants and different opportunities through um, coastal community grants and things like that. Um, having that comp plan approved with the state is um, was was kind of that one hurdle. Um, I think it's a good opportunity to look as we move forward into these bigger plans to definitely take advantage of all the grant opportunities we can. Um, and I know we have um, our sustainability coordinator. That's also one of her tasks is looking for grants and she combs through for any opportunities with that. Sorry to jump down there. Oh, no. <laughs> so we can stay because we're going to go to you in just a second. Um, I, I would say I, I did spend a good amount of time trying to normalize your budgets because you, know, you have public <laughs> works, a piece, a piece of you. Um, I, I, I was very pleased with your budget submission. I, I, it, I didn't get the sense that you're asking for anything that you didn't need. I thought it was fairly frugal. Um, so uh, I appreciate that. Happy to have you on board. Thank you. Uh, good job. I'm leaving. You're off the hook. <laughs> and can we get through Angela? Yeah. Sure. We're at eight o'clock, but I think we, yeah. we don't want to force you to join we're us for another fun meeting, but you're welcome to. <laughs> okay, uh, we have Angela Plant's chat uh, from our engineering, our, our newly formed engineering department. Uh, so it's all you. <laughs> um, so yes, for my review, similarly, just looking at, we are a new department as of September of 22, um, when the council formed um, the Engineering Technical Services Department. Uh, we uh, include four positions. Myself as a town engineer, we have an engineering technician, the sustainability coordinator, which I know you see lots of Jamie Fitch um, with different um, environmental initiatives that she brings forward. And our GIS administrator, you may not see as much of, uh, although recently probably has been included with some of the mapping pieces. Um, and then our budget, as you mentioned, trying to look at how we kind of present that. Um, I tried in one of the exhibits, there is exhibit nine that shows um, of the 23 budget, here's the line items, or as I sat down with um, Autumn and Doug Howard that talked earlier, we went through public works and the planning department budgets and really agreed on, okay, here's kind of what the oversight for the engineering at the time division had in each of those departments and kind of agreed that, yeah, that makes sense that this slides over and so that we have a true number on what that looked like um, if we actually had a 23 budget. So our drivers uh, with four staff members uh, were, uh, and were pretty small department. So salary um, and the associated costs with that are our biggest driver. Um, for the increase that I am showing. The other piece um, that jumps out, because obviously our increases are, as I 
a dollar number are pretty small. Um, the other larger one is contracted services. And that includes um, how we comply with our MS4 um, stormwater permit. Um, there is some regional groups that we are um, collaborate with that have dues associated with that that's increasing. Um, and, um, and also with the new permit that um, I think I've talked to council about that came into effect in 22, uh, 2022. So it's into this fiscal year. I think I mentioned to council last year when we were talking about the new permit that there wasn't immediate implications to the budget, but there would be in the next fiscal year. And so now that's where we're seeing is um, there's additional water quality testing around our outfalls. Um, and I was pretty excited to hear Tom describe a catch basin earlier. I think that's the highlight of my week. <laughs> Did I get it right? <laughs> so, um, so, so that's the, the driving pieces. I was actually kind of um, happy to, to talk about how the alignment of the council goals, because this is our department, um, sustainability and conservation and transportation are two of the main things that I would say engineering technical services does, um, along with obviously supporting all the other departments and their technical needs. Um, so, with that, I have environmental compliance and initiatives. Um, essentially, that a, a big piece of it is really our MS4, as I mentioned, our federal permit. Um, there's also initiatives that come through different um, committees or boards. Um, no Mo May is something that we have our little signs that um, Jamie put together. So we really are kind of the, the facilitator to try to get those ideas to reality. Um, as I said, we support, um, with, along with the planning department, um, conservation commission and sustainability. Um, the sustainability committee's um, newest initiative they're trying to push forward also is sustainable Scarborough Day coming in the fall. Um, so we were asked to put in, there is actually a new line item um, associated with uh, public events and information really geared around things like that, or um, Summerfest, we do a table on clean water education or recycling, those type of things, and to have some kind of um, budget associated with that. Um, we also administer the environmental CIPs. We just are finishing up one at Phillips Brook, which probably no one sees, but um, we actually restored a floodplain. So it's really the health of the stream that we're looking at. And even though you're driving by probably Payne Road, you do not see it. Um, a huge difference, I would say, in the environmental and clear water protection pieces. And then lastly on this is just um, working with the planning department and looking at ways to enhance our environmental compliance um, ordinances. Uh, we just I just came through with our post-construction ordinance with erosion and sediment control ordinance. And then you, future, I'll be coming fairly shortly in with um, looking at low impact development ordinances that are required through our permit, as well as um, enhancing the stream buffers for our urban impaired green. So the next one was traffic and transportation. Um, again, we work closely with the transportation committee on their initiatives. Um, we're looking at collaborating with community services around bike racks at our municipal facilities, those type of things that's in some of our operation um, budget. Then uh, we also end up, there is a line item in here for engineering that just moved from the planning department. And I utilize that for things like these small traffic related projects or grants that come up during the year. We try to align what we can to say, here's an opportunity. Um, but at some points they come in odd times. And one of those example is the Sawyer Street project um, that we were collaborating with Cape Elizabeth and looking at their grant opportunity. We needed a match that comes out of our operating budget because we wanted to grab a hold of that and kind of work collaborative. So those opportunities, just trying to make sure that we can um, collaborate when we can. Um, we administer the roadway and transportation CIPs uh, along with public works. Gorham Road is one of ours because um, it's a regional project that we have funding through PACS, which I attend the PACS um, policy committee. So 
um, looking at more of the regional projects and kind of bringing that money um, to Scarborough. And yeah, then with that acronym, PACT. I'm sorry, um, the Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation System. So it stretches from Freeport to Biddeford mm -hmm. and then out to Wyndham. <laughs> aligned, uh, largely aligned with GPCOG. Yes. And the last thing um, with the volume that Autumn just talked about coming through the planning office, we, um, my staff would be um, responsible as it comes into construction and post-construction. So we have a lot of oversight and for transportation that really has to do with, there's a lot of work happening in our right-of-ways for offsites, which a lot of it is tied to the development happening in town. And so, I take our role as kind of that watchdog, um, not only in the design process to make sure um, our local interests are being met, but also during construction um, to make sure that, again, if there are cons local concerns that they're getting incorporated into those type of projects. Um, even be at sometimes our um, concerns or interests don't always align with a DEP or DOT permit. Um, they'll give you the black and white, here's the statute. There's concerns locally that we can say, we need, we also need this. Um, so that's kind of like what our department does. And I think that's, yeah. Quick question. Um, we had, I, th I think you helped us with this. Uh, we had a Coastal Waters and Harbor mm -hmm. Committee meeting recently, which tried to uh, talk about the various types of testing that we do. There are three or four different groups testing different things as it relates to sustainability and conservation. You know, one is uh, Safe Beaches, Todd mm -hmm. does that, I guess. And then yep. uh, another one is uh, our sanitary district. And then the Harbor Master, you know, keeps track of things, uh, you know, for rain closures. There's a fourth one I can't think of. But can you can you uh, uh, give us your idea of where that should reside, uh, or do we just keep doing it with you know bits and pieces and not have a, a rope around the whole thing? Um, I think as we talked about in that group when everyone came together, I, I think it's difficult because we're testing um, different things for different reasons, as you mentioned. One task that um, goes through Maine Healthy Beaches really is so that people can swim. And then there's um, Department of Marine, Marine Resources so that you can eat the clams that come out. And then as the sewer district has their own, similar to our MS4 permit, they have a federal permit that says their, their discharge has to be at this level. And each of those tests are very different. And I think what we described there, it's like comparing apples to lemons to oranges. It's there. And while it's all really good information, it's hard to look at this data and this data and compare that. And so I think what the best course, and I think what we came out of that meeting, I think was to have a sort of like a landing page because the DEP calculates their data. Uh, DMR does theirs. Maine Healthy Beaches does their sewer district, all that, trying to get everybody to at least share that data and put it on mm -hmm. one base that you can see and maybe see, as you had pointed out, I think, see trends. Yeah. But you kind of had, unfortunately, it's kind of in silos, yeah. but you can at least see, okay, this is starting to do this while this is also starting to do, you know what I mean? And you can kind of see that. I think there's um, definitely parameters that are set that that's when red flags go off. Yep. So, and we each have different thresholds mm -hmm. um, with that data. So I think having us kind of, I know it, it sounds like an, a little odd to have those kind of silos, but then you have a focused group looking at this. And when it hits that level, we have an SOP in place with community services. When Maine Healthy Beaches numbers go up, there's a process and a, standard procedure we do um, and how we retest and how we notice the public and how we do all of that. So if I, if I hear you correctly, and the reason I keep asking this question is because people mm -hmm. ask me, well, what's the solution? I said, I don't know. I keep asking people and nobody you know, can really get an answer. Those can go on for a while, but it sounds like if, if I hear you correctly, that we would 
try to have someone help us. Maybe it's a communications task, and I'm very reluctant to suggest assignments, but you know, doing a score board or a score mm -hmm. card, and then we go from there. But it, but you're, I thought you did a nice job of describing the sort of problem statement that's did, you know, what's it telling us? You know, mm -hmm. so I think we can play a role in coordination. Though. Yeah, I, mean, I think that there's all these different tests being done for different reasons, yeah. mm -hmm. but they all reside in different places. Yeah. So I think there's certainly some some room for us to, to move into, to coordinate all that and present it. And then I think coming up with a better way of understanding what does it all mean. This has come up in Conservation Commission. Yeah. And in our meeting last month, we found out that the Friends of Scarborough Marsh apparently are also doing water testing. They do, yes. And I think, I I think <laughs> the more that Don and I talked about it and the more I've been on, I just, is there a central place we could put all of it? I think, I think we were generally like, we didn't realize that they were testing it. We didn't realize that Todd did this testing. Mm -hmm. Is there somewhere that, you know, Harbor and Todd can log in and say, well, maybe this isn't what we're looking at, but maybe they're seeing trends with it, like just a centrally located, because it seems like a lot of people, even people we might not be aware of, are doing these test things, and maybe they're, and I, I think there's like Scarborough and the Marsh is just sending it to the state, I think, and so I don't know if, you know, it's being documented locally, if they're coordinated, it's about coordinating, just like with our boards and with all these different groups testing, I just, because it's coming up a lot. And I think at one point someone said, can Conservation Commission manage it? And I was like, yeah, no, they can't. They're a group of volunteers. Um, that's not something they can handle. Um, so I think it is something that we do need to do considering our resources and where we're located. And I don't know if that's your department or just something that Jamie could assist on or just kind of coordinating all we, of that. I think we talked about also, because Conservation Commission was at that meeting that Councilor Hamlet was talking about as all the groups coming together that had interest. And... Um, we also talked about having, I think similar to something else, I think this, uh, that the council had talked about is doing more of like a, a periodic subcommittee of one from coastal waters and someone from conservation and someone and having the staff there to kind of facilitate and then at least give some feedback and information to go back to the respective committees. But I do think, yeah, having, that's what we had talked about was trying to find a landing page. The problem is how, um, the state or other groups even collect their data and display it is different. So we were kind of heading towards, it'd be better to have a place, I think, to have a link that here's what is being tested. Here's the link to get you to the sanitary district. Here's the link to get you to DMR. Here's the link to get there because um, we really don't want to manage other people's data. Um, and also there's strict quality control standards when you speak about testing. And that was one of the things that came up, I think in coastal waters, when someone's standing there and just taking a sample next to their boot or where off the pier where all the birds are, um, gets a very different reading. <laughs> so, um, and it's, so all data is not equal either. So you have to be trained and, and have actually they have a quality control plan in place that you're following. Um, it's for strict guidelines from the state on how you test. So a little reluctant just to throw whatever information on there, but I'm happy to kind of put it all into something digestible on the town site and to link to all of these entities and partners. If that makes sense. Then step two would be trying to make sense of what does all, all that data mean. And that's where I think coming together as a group would help kind of, yeah, go through that data and, and really look at it and what that means. Great. Thanks. Todd? You know, that was, that was yeah. a hard part in that meeting. It was, it came, uh, there was a fifth category because we had a private business owner testing their seafood. That's what, yes. So, <laughs> that's what I was expecting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The education piece of what it really means because if you're looking at this metric yeah. and what that meant, mm -hmm. two different things. So I know they're exactly right. It's, it's a metric for what we're testing for. Mm -hmm. There's no holistic. I think so. I think with a fairly little effort and low cost, we can assemble information, kind of make it available. And then I think the next step would be to understand what, what can we do from that point forward. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I can work with that. Okay. So that was educational for me. I, I love bringing data together and you don't know what you're going to learn. You might, it might be nothing, but you might, when you, when you have it in the same place, you might observe some things that are God, we're useful. We're about a project we had in life here. Ah, that's right up my alley, actually. <laughs> um, did you have any questions? Uh, I want to tell you, there's a couple of 
SIP items mm -hmm. under your budget. Um, two of them are uh, are using impact fees, and that's the Payne Road District One and Two traffic signal upgrades and the Oak Hill traffic improvements. Can Can you talk to me a little bit about those projects? So we're in our CITs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they're, they're assigned to your department. But. Yes. Yep. So the um, the Oak Hill and the Payne Road, yeah, using our traffic impact fee money, that is something a, a previous council had done a, um, is it a resolution? resolution. Um, essentially designating specific funds to go towards um, some of the offsite improvements, the downs um, is obligated to do. However, we were partnering with them and saying, um, we already have a deficiency. And so trying to get back up to kind of neutral so that then when their project moves forward and they add traffic, they're, they're mitigating their impacts and beyond. So that was the conversation with the council at the time was trying to pay our fair share to kind of get back to a, a neutral place um, rather than we're starting at a negative, I would say in terms of traffic. Do you know what we'll get for that? What, what? Uh, oh yeah. Oak Hill traffic improvements? Them? Yeah. yeah. So the Oak Hill traffic improvements are actually um, a safety um, project that uh, DOT um, had, had requested is um, around um, the traffic islands on the four legs of Oak Hill. Um, there is uh, tr try to take lefts in and out. Um, it's really about access management mm -hmm. and the number of crashes. Um, we were just talking at transportation committee about um, a new regional um, initiative, uh, Vision Zero, about eliminating fatalities and serious crashes. And the heat map, I mean, Oak Hill is glowing and you look at it as a regional map. So that was um, something that DOT was definitely pushing for to try to get us to address. And that would be the Oak Hill improvements. The other one, uh, Payne Road Districts 1 and 2, we have five districts for Payne Road. 1 and 2 basically is from the South Portland line to um, Gorham Road in Payne. So that corridor, um, really that commercial corridor, it would be adding um, adaptive traffic signal system like they're doing now on Route 1. We have it in Dunstan. Yep, so it would be doing it along that corridor. And then you'll see in the next um, budget, next year's budget, we'll be coming through with a District 3, same thing as continuing that kind of project down the line. So the timing of these, yep. uh, these projects are totally in concert with the requirements of the TMP. So it's really dictated by that work plan. And at least for the Payne Road 1 and 2, I believe the intention is we put a budget number in here that's probably more money than will exist at the time the funds are needed. Right. So what, I, what I've done is worked with finance to come out up with what is in the accounts currently. And I think I've, I've put that in the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Oak Hill it has like 167,000 and we were requesting an allocation up to 200,000 that could be um, allocated as we collect more in funds, but it would go but through yeah, prior, approval. Prior council action uh, actually uh, authorized use of these funds or, or indicated that our willingness to put these funds toward these projects and match um, private money and state money. Um, and at least uh, for the Payne Road ones for this pro for this next year, the intention is to close those out. So whatever the balance is, uh, will be what they get. It will be less than we expect, it will be less than what we have uh, in here at 350. And the intention is to close those out because they're so old and antiquated. Uh, the projects that they were originally based on are will be satisfied. And our intention is to replace them with new better justified traffic impact fees. And I will say during the negotiations with the Downs TMP between the with the town and DOT and the developer, DOT was pretty adamant that you can't have, I mean, we're going on decades. Over 20 years for the pain road. And we we were told no more when the, you need to part for partnering. We gotta we gotta use that money. And um, what the other develop, because this is money that other developments have paid in per trip. So to use it for the intended use, right? So it's all for that piece of the corridor. You need to spend it 
you need to close it out. And then um, our next task will be coming up with um, new areas that are need new traffic impact fees. Um, and so that's what will be coming forward. Yeah, with yeah we you. intend to have a workshop in May, I believe, right. uh, generally on, on impact fees in the next next step. We're looking forward to that. Uh, I'm not surprised that there, some of these have been going around for a while. It probably takes 10 years to figure out who's going to pay what. <laughs> so uh, if there aren't sufficient funds in the impact the accounts at the time you make the disbursement, what amount are you going to disperse? They'll get whatever exists at the time. They, so it'll be cast at whatever time. And we put I think a budget it's up number, to, yeah. Yeah, we put a budget number in here that we were speculating because there'll be additional fees that we'll collect from other developers between now and whenever that happens. We're quite confident it will be less than the numbers that are shown here in the budget, but it will be whatever it is. Because again, DOT insists that we close them out and be done. Because the other part of that, and this is, I'm really looking forward to the workshop because I know we've been, you know, herping about on this theme for a long time uh, to, to, to make sure that we are, you know, number one, uh, that our fees are fair and appropriate and that we're collecting the right amounts. And then number two, that the irresponsible parties are, you know, have very appropriate shares of, of, of collecting and you know, paying them and re receiving you know, reimbursements. So uh, the Redbrook Watershed Management Plan. Glad you asked. Okay. Where is Red Brook, by the way? <laughs> Red Brook is actually one of in the the Payne Road corridor commercial area. That's where that's one of our two urban impaired streams. It it's runs... also uh, Councilor Katarina's backyard. So it's yeah. really good. <laughs> <laughs> um it does run, yes, from County Road all the way down through to um the Payne Road commercial corridor. Um and we, into Long Creek ultimately, is that right? Um uh, into Casco Bay. Casco. Yeah. Um so this is uh prior to me coming, um, and I believe it was 2000. 11, there was a Redbrook watershed management plan. It was one of the first, I would say, um, there were only a handful in the state when it was developed. It was kind of a guinea pig um, looking at, it really is a roadmap to um, clean water and, um, and what you do to clean up and get the testing back to a category that shows that um, you're improving the health of that stream. So it really gave um, specific projects outlined how to get there. Um, it was a partnership with MTA. Uh, DOT has a lot of impervious area that goes directly into um, Red Brook, as well as obviously a lot of parking lots um, and commercial development. And um, it's been now the pieces that I would say can be done, should be done, have pretty much been checked off that list. And also we've learned a lot, right? So since 2011, uh, most communities now do have watershed management plans on their urban impaired streams. There's been a lot of progress in looking at how you clean those up, what are the new emerging issues, those type of things. And we really just need a complete fresh look at Red Brook and to revisit that. I will say it's also one of our permit requirements um, for coming up for this year so that we need to go back and actually revisit that and update it um, as part of our, our federal stormwater permit. Um, so that's the goal is uh, we work, I should mention too, that uh, we share the watershed with South Portland. They um, have been great partners um, in doing a lot of in-stream testing for us. Um, they own certain specialized equipment, things like that. And so we're, it's, it's been a good partnership to try to, um, to move that initiative forward. So there are a lot of things we can do um, internally as staff. It will take a lot of our time, Jamie Fitch's time um, and myself, but um, I think it's just bringing everybody together and try to um, come up with a plan to, to restore that brook. Is yep. there a map of the various watersheds in town? It's actually on my wall in my office. <laughs> no, is that <laughs> it is. That's, that's I look at it every day. <laughs> is it on the GIS map? It, can you, yes. It's a layer in the GIS? It is a layer on GIS. Check that out while I go. Yes. Yeah. Um, First thing we ask when applicants come in, what watershed are you in? <laughs> it's the quiz. <laughs> is there a Redbrook fee? Or is there so there is. Um, 
when you have a watershed management plan, you're able to also come up with um, a compensation utilization fee. Um, and what it means is we had to come up with a plan that DEP has to approve on how you can use those funds. We do have one, again, completely outdated um, that talks about using those funds towards modeling and more analysis. And I would rather gear that towards um, boots on the ground fixing issues. So I would like to revisit that as part of this watershed plan. So this plan update, I believe, will in part in, yeah, in part provide some fairly specific details and yeah, costs projects. about um, specific improvements projects. Yeah. And, and it can be like fixing be a culvert or removing impervious area in certain areas, things like that. There's like construction costs. Now, is there a fund? So, uh, so what, yes. what I'm wondering so is, what is there money from the last plan <laughs> that can help pay for the new plan? Or no, so I can't use that for I this. Wasn't allowed. Okay. It's a very, very specific. And like I said, it's outdated to, to the point where the things that are, it specifically says you can use that money for um, is really nothing we probably want to do. Um, and so we'll, we'll be updating that, but essentially as development comes through and does um, wetland impacts, they typically with development, you pay an in lieu fee to the state because we have um, the CFUP in place, they have to write a check to the town of Scarborough. That includes, um, because we manage it and take the lead, that includes um, development in South Portland that's actually in the Red Brook. So I get calls a lot from um, developers in South Portland like that are developing along like Muzzy Road, um, even out behind um, John Roberts Road. Um, they pay into, they, they write a check to the town of Scarborough when they're going through the South Portland Planning Department. So um, we have collected some money and it would be good to have a list of projects which would come out of this plan um, to be able to use those funds. That was very helpful. Um, and this is my last question, I promise. That, so the Sawyer Street, I know we've talked about that collaborating oh, with right. Elizabeth, but what's the restoration study? Is, is that a tag on project or is? No, it's, um, it's really about if you, it's the study to look at if you, did remove Sawyer Street, that area in the marsh, what would be the restoration for the actual marsh to make that um, whole again, there would be um, some restoration work that would have to happen associated with that. Like, do you pull, do you just let it go to mother nature or do you actually, that's the study is looking at, do you pull out all the gravel? Are you pulling, where, how wide? It really impacts lots of things about flooding and habitat. And there's gonna be groups, um, on all sides of that, on how that works for different types of habitat, right? For different um, animals or birds, there's conflicting and that's really looking at studying it. So that's a match. Right. Um, there's a grant. So that's this a, represents Scarborough's okay. share of match and to a larger, so we would, larger grant. So it'd be a $300,000 grant. Um, so Cape Elizabeth is putting in 35,000. They've asked that we put in 35,000, um, and, and go work through this study. That sounds like a lot. <laughs> Any other questions, Des? Thank you very Great. much. And thank you everybody for, for staying through the whole thing. I know we went a little over, but, uh, the items that we deferred, we'll pick up at a future session or one of the latter uh, sessions. Uh, apologize for not getting through everything. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, are there any members of the public that would like to comment on anything? <laughs> we outlasted them. <laughs> Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Thanks night. Thank you very much. Thank you.